session. Now we have uh, Mark Watson from Princeton, Princeton University. He will present uh, cyclically sensitive inflation. Mark Watson is a Harvard, Howard Harrison and Gabriel Snyder Beck Professor of Economic and Public Affairs at Princeton University. He's also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and consultant at the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. His research focuses on time series econometrics, empirical macroeconomics, and macroeconomic forecasting. He held previous position at Harvard University, Northwestern University, and Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. He holds a PhD in economics from the University of California, San Diego. Mark, thank you very much. You have 35 minutes. Great, well, it's great to be here. I'm gonna get out of the light. Um, I think I can't hide from it, though, actually. Okay, so this is, um, this is work with uh, Jim Stock. Some of you probably have seen this before. This is a, a, a paper that we wrote for uh, an ECB conference in, in June um, in, in Portugal, and uh, Jim was there. I didn't see it, so uh, I figured I'd give it here, see what, see what it was all about. Um, we'd hope to make some more progress on this um, uh, before I got here, but we haven't. So, uh, so it's the same stuff. So here's the, um, he, he, here's the issue. Um, it's a pretty simple, this is a, really quite a simple paper. Um, it's really a paper, it's a paper about trying to reverse engineer something. Just, am I okay? Okay, okay, is that my okay? Everything's okay, you look pensive here. Okay, 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 so, uh, Okay, so here's the story, right? Uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm gonna look at, um, the paper has uh, some data on inflation and various slack measures, um, a real economic uh, sort of business cycle indicators for the United States and for Europe. Um, here in this talk, I'm just gonna look at the US data. Okay, I'm not gonna look at the European data, and there's nothing for, from uh, Chile or other countries. Okay, so I'm just going to look at the U.S. data, and and uh, you know, I guess what we've learned, you know, from from some of the other talks is some of the puzzles in the U.S. appear in other, or some of the issues in the U.S. appear in other countries as well, too. So, so hopefully there's something uh, uh, interesting here, um, or more general than just the U.S. But anyway, so here's the story, right? So here's the unemployment rate in the United States from 2010 to uh, this is through the second quarter of. Uh, 2018, and you know the unemployment rate has fallen from, you know, 10 to you know below four, right? So a big change in the unemployment rate. You know what's happened to inflation? Well, you know, not a whole heck of a lot. The um, the blue line here is is headline uh, inflation. So this is headline PCE, personal consumption expenditures, right? And the uh, you know, and the red is core. So that's you know excluding food and energy. Uh, in this particular sector, right? And so that's the, right, the, the, there doesn't seem to be a, you know, negative correlation, right, or, uh, uh, between, these, between these things, right? So that's the puzzle. So here's another way of saying the same puzzle. This is just a regression, right? So, uh, you know, so on the, uh, on the um, uh, x-axis, we have the, uh, the unemployment gaps. This is the unemployment rate minus, uh, uh, the CBO's uh, estimate of the natural rate, and then we have uh, on the vertical axis we have the uh, four-quarter inflation, uh, excuse the the four-quarter inflation rate, right for the U.S. The four-quarter difference in that, right? So it's uh, it's the annual difference in annual inflation, right? And you can see, you know, if you just you know ran a regression, right, uh, in the early period. You know, you'd get the blue line in the middle period, you get the orange line, and in the later period, you get the green line, right? So it looks like the slope of this thing, right, is 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 changing, right? So so that's the that's the question, right? So you know, I guess I can say, you know, what we're going to do, going back to this picture, um, you know, it's again, it's sort of reverse engineering. So we're going to ask, 
write in this paper pretty simply, you know, suppose we did some kind of reasonable things to the black line, right? Could we make this thing change, right? Could we get a different correlation or going here, right? Right, suppose we change the activity measure. Could we somehow make this thing look more stable, right? And the answer is going to turn out to be no. I mean, n or not very much, right? And then we're going to ask, well, suppose we change the inflation measure, right? Can we get anything out, out of that? And the answer is going to be, yeah, maybe some, right? So, so that's so. So x-axis, no. Y-axis, little something. Okay, so, so that's what the paper's about. That's what the paper does. Okay, so that's it, OK? Um, OK, so that's what this says. OK, and the way we're going to do it, I should say, you know, the way we're going to change the, uh, the y-axis, the way we're going to change inflation is we're going to look at, uh, you know, PC, we're going to look at different sectors. So we're going to look at, you know, you know, the price of shirts and uh, shoes, right, and gasoline and housing services and medical services, right? And we can look at each of those separately, right, and see if there are some sectors, right, some components of the PCE that you know, are more cyclically sensitive, are more stably, highly correlated with the slack measure than others, right? And we're going to ask why you might expect that, right? And, and, uh, and, um, and the answer there is going to be pretty clear, right? If you've got, you know, traded goods, right? Maybe they're not going to react to, to domestic things that go on the, in the U.S. economy. U.S. economy is pretty big, as it turns out, so that kind of holds a little weight, but not a lot, right? And then it turns out, you know, in the U.S., you know, some of our price measures, you know, are really pretty lousy, right? So they're very noisy, right? They're not very good measures. So, you know, if they're pretty lousy measures, it's not surprising maybe that they're not moving around a lot, right, when other things are, right? I mean, real market prices might be moving, but we just don't measure them well, right? So those are going to be the two, the two stories, I guess, um, right? And then we'll, we'll sort of take these sectors you know, that seem to be, you know, pretty highly correlated with activity and we'll average them, right? And we'll get, uh, you know, something that's a, an index of inflation using these particular sectors that seem to be, that seem to be, you know, uh, most highly correlated, you know, with, with um, real activity. Okay, so uh, the data is quarterly and uh, we're going to look at um, four quarter inflation. So PT uh, minus PT minus four, right? And then often what we're going to do is, you know, we're going to first difference this, but we'll look at year over year changes. Okay, so, so those, those are the data. Okay, so, you know, let's just go back to the, to the outline here. So the first thing, you know, can you, uh, this is one of Jim's slides, so he uses words like resuscitate, right? So can, can we resuscitate, right, the Phillips curve by using different measures of activity, slack measures, right? The answer is going to be no. Let me show you, you know, we, we look at about, I don't know, 15 of these, right? So, so you, you know, you might expect, right, there are lots of, you know, discussion, right, in the U.S. If you look at the unemployment rate, the unemployment rate of the last 10 years has moved, but, you know, the recession was really severe, and the pool of people who are unemployed are different than they are in typical recession, so maybe the unemployment rate, right, isn't the best indicator. Maybe we want to use something like, I don't know, a short-term unemployment rate or something like that might be more reasonable, right? Maybe we want to look at an employment to population ratio or maybe an employment to population ratio for certain, you know, groups, you know, age groups, 25 to 54, uh, prime age. You know, maybe we want to look at, um, you know, a GDP gap or something like that, or maybe we want to look at capacity utilization, right? Later on, we'll talk about, gee, if we're looking at these gap things, right, how do you compute the center of the gap, right? Some of these are CBO measures, right, but maybe you could use some time series methods, right, some smoothing methods and also compute those, right? So here are, you know, I guess there's eight of them there, right? You can see they kind of move together, I guess. But, but you know, they're different enough, right, that maybe, you know, some of this can potentially be explained by them, right? So I showed you... You know, I showed you data, you know, from here, 2010 to 2018, right? And these measures behave a little differently over that period. So maybe there's, there's something there. Um, there's a black line that going through this, which is kind of an average of those, actually a principal component, right? And so you might think about using, we have multiple measures, so maybe we're just going to average these guys, 
Okay, well, you can convince yourself, I think, very quickly, you know, that this isn't going to explain the story, right? Just, you know, do some scatter plots, if you will, or some correlations for all these different measures, and you see the same phenomenon, right? You see this flattening, right? Regardless of the measure of economic activity that you use, you know, here's some, these are all going to be um, Phillips correlation, so this is just going to be the correlation between this yearly difference in yearly inflation, right, against a four-quarter moving average of a variety of these slack measures. So here's the number, right, there's the scatter plot that we saw at the beginning, the unemployment gap, right, the correlations fall in, in the early period from about a half to about, you know, a tenth now, and if you look at, you know, the slope of that, um, of those three lines, right, that were plotted, right, they went from, you know, pretty steep to pretty flat, okay? And if you look across this, right, you sort of see that everywhere, right? The correlation, you know, the, the details differ, right? But you see the same thing across all of these, right? Um, okay, so, so, so that's that, okay. So, so you, you know, that, that kind of doesn't do it. Let me show you in, um, I'm gonna start doing some work now looking at the inflation measures where we, we're gonna get some, some action, I think. Um, or more than zero action, we got zero action here, right? And for, to do that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at some sectors, I'm gonna look at prices from some sectors of, of uh, consumer goods, right? And ask whether those are co correlated with activity. So I need to tell you what activity measure I'm gonna use to do those calculations, okay? So here's what we use in, in the body of the paper, so here are, you know, here's the short-term unemployment rate, the employment rate, these are both inverted, right? Employment in po to population ratio, um, employment capacity utilization, and uh, gross domestic output, uh, geometric average of GDP and GDI in the United States, the income measure, and the expenditure measure, those are all plotted there, standardized and plotted, right? And then, you know, average those guys or average them in some sort of, you know, slightly more complicated way, computer principal component, right, and that's the black thing, right? So what we're gonna do in the body of the work is we're gonna use this black measure. Everything here, I should say, I guess I should say, we're interested in cyclical activity, right? So we've taken these data and we've filtered them, right, to highlight what's going on over the business cycle, six to 32 quarters. So we've done, you know, so we've done sort of bandpass filtering on these to eliminate trends, right, low frequency stuff, and to average out noise. Okay, so, so that's, that's what we have here, right? And you can see these guys, guys kind of look the same, but they kind of look different, right? So we're gonna, this black thing is gonna be our activity measure. I'll talk a little later on about robustness, so to speak, of our results, right? What happens if you, you know, change the black thing to something else? You use the blue thing or the red thing, or you don't do a bandpass thing, you do a this or a that or a this or that, right? And as it turns out, not much is gonna change. Okay, so now, uh, this is the way, okay, so, so you could break down the goods that go into the PCE in the United States, you can break them down pretty finely, right? We're only gonna break them down into these 17 categories. Um, we use these, so, so, and these are the shares, these are the shares, average shares uh, in the, over the last 10 years, okay? So you can see, you know, um, a housing is important, right, 16%. You can see healthcare probably is important. Yeah, okay, good, healthcare is important, 16%. Uh, less important things, uh, financial consumption expenditures of nonprofit institutions serving households, right? So this is, these are things like religious services, right? That's a consumption good, okay? So interestingly, we're going to have to measure the market price of that, right? That's kind of hard. I, I'm sorry, maybe, for, anyway. Um, okay, so, 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 so that's that. That's only 3%, 2.8%. 2, 2 okay, great, okay. So, uh, so in other work, uh, uh, Jim and I, looked at, um, we were interested in other work in thinking about forecasting future headline PCE or aggregate PCE, 
right? Um, are thinking about the trend value of inflation in the United States, right? The trend value is something you might expect to continue into the future. And in that work, what we did is, you know, you could, you could just look at inflation, aggregate inflation, and, and forecast that, right? Or you could think about forecasting aggregate inflation, forecasting aggregate inflation, but using, right, this aggregate information. And we found it was pretty useful to sort of break things up. You know, these different, you know, sectors tell you different things about the future, right? So that turned out to be pretty, pretty useful work. They have sort of different properties. And, and so, so this little exercise is to ask, you know, not do they have different forecasting ability, do they have different information about trends, right, the long run level of inflation, right? But, you know, are they correlated differentially with economic activity? So are they different indicators of, of, of slack in the economy, okay? Um, okay, so you're faced with a, okay, so as I said, you know, there, there are reasons, you know, clear reasons why you think, right, maybe they might have, they might behave differentially. One is, you know, some of these sectors have more traded goods than others, right? And the other, some of these sectors, the prices are not measured very well. In other sectors, they're very measured very well. So here, right, religious services, right, we don't measure the price of that very well, okay? So, like, getting back to Bart's, what Bart was talking about, right? So how do we measure this? The wages we pay to ministers or priests. Right, so, so that's the way that's measured. Okay, so, okay. Um, there, there's some other sectors here, I guess I should talk about them. Um, I got recreation goods and vehicles, okay? So that's, when you say that, that sounds a lot like, you know, tennis rackets and RVs, trailers, right? Stuff that you could measure market prices, you know, and baseballs and basketballs and stuff like that, right? That's right, but it also has uh, home computers in it and Xboxes and stuff like that. It turns out, right, those goods are changing a lot, right? So it turns out that's a sector, right, where a lot of the important action comes from this new consumer electronics that's measured very poorly because of new goods issues, okay? Um, some of these sectors, are measured pretty well, you know, gasoline and other energy goods, fine. Uh, food and beverages purchased for off-premises consumption, those are the right, prices at grocery stores, right? So we measure that stuff pretty well, okay? Some stuff we measure, some of it pretty well and some of it pretty poorly. You know, healthcare, right? The sort of components that go into our consumer price index, right? So that's measured by, you know, what consumers pay out of pocket, right? In the United States, we pay out of pocket when we buy Advil, ibuprofen at the drugstore, so that's fine, right? And when we pay, when we go to our doctors and we make our little co-payments, $10 for my annual checkup, right? So that, that part is measured well, right? But the amount of my over, but what goes into the PCE, in, in contrast to what goes into the CPI in the United States, right, is, is the price of my checkup at the doctor, right? So that's my $10 copay, but also what the doctor receives from my insurance company, right? And that's negotiated between those guys, right? And when I go in, you know, when I had my hip replaced, right, there were all of these, you know, you know, I paid a little bit, right, and my insurance company had negotiations with the, you know, hospital for special surgery in New York, and they worked out, right? So all of those things turn out to be less well measured, right? Those things turn out to be less well measured, and measured, you know, a lot of that's measured by, you know, the, the wages of doctors and things like that, right? The kinds of things that Bart were talking, was talking about. So what you can do, and... Um, um, so that's what this says, right? So what you can do, and, and Jim did this, um, is you can go through this stuff like sector by sector, and you can, like, I don't know, read detail about, right, how it's computed, right? And you can talk to people who know stuff, right? Because there are people that, like, are experts in this, right? And what Jim did is went through all of these sort of sector by sector and wrote down what's good, what's measured well, what's measured poorly, et cetera, 
took a bunch of notes, those are in the paper, right? And, you know, in the paper, if you look at the appendix, right, you can kind of see, um, you know, some little notes on each of these different sectors. So this is a fun sector. This is actually measured well. This is food and beverages for off-premises uh, consumption, food at grocery stores, turns out to be measured well, right? It's got some interesting things for it, right? Notice the volatility in the early period, right, is much higher than the later period. Kind of interesting, right? In the United States, when we think about core inflation, X food and energy, right? Why did people start leading out, leaving food out? Well, because of all of this volatility back here, right? If you think about, gee, what's been going on the last 20 years, it's not very volatile, right? So it should really be back in core. Okay. So you can go through all of these. You know, it turns out housing is one of these things. Housing services are reasonably well estimated, right? We've got surveys of rental units of different types. You know, they're nicely done with rotating panels, et cetera. Um, um, and so this turns out to be measured reasonably well, at least in the last uh, 35 years or so. Okay, so again, you can sort of go through you know, you can just hear health care is okay. Financial services, you can see, right? So a big part of financial services is, uh, you know, the value of some financial services that are provided without payment, right? Like uh, financial services from keeping money in a checking account. Probably some people still do that. I still do that, but maybe no one else does, right? Uh, and, um, you know, I earn zero interest on that, right? So what are, what's the value of the services I'm getting? It's the foregone interest, so, right? So what do they, what do the, you know, price guys do, right? They try and figure out the foregone interest, right? And you can see, right, that I guess that foregone interest was pretty smooth here, right? And was pretty wild there, right? They kind of changed the method, right, that they use for estimating this. Okay, so fine, so you can go through these one at a time, and oh, here's one, here's one, mm -hmm. clothing, right? Okay, so I didn't know this, so it okay, so, so when Jim did this, he said clothing is like personal computers. It's like new electronics and consumer goods. And I said, well, that's weird, right? And he said, well, Mark, that's because you're wearing the same suit, right, that you bought 20 years ago and the same shoes you bought 25 years ago. There are a lot of people who, like, you know, these things turn over every year, right, and, they're, right? and chaining all that stuff in turns out to be hard. So as it turns out, clothing and footwear, right, is like PCs, right? They are major new good products associated with that. I wouldn't think they're new goods, right? But they are new goods, okay? Okay, so you can, you can do all of this, right? And, and what you get out of this, and this, we're not gonna really use, the, we're gonna use some of this in the analysis, right? But we're not gonna use all of this in the analysis, is you can sort of categorize these things useful, kind of usefully, and to help sort of thinking about the results we're going to look at in just a few minutes, right, into some sectors where these things are, are measured pretty well, right? Some sectors where things are measured like sort of, sort of okay, uh, right? Uh, Health care, right? Some things are measured well here, some things aren't, right? And some things that aren't measured very well, right? This is religious services, right? Clothing, right? This is uh, uh, fire, right? And this is recreational goods, right, PCs, if you will. Okay, so now, right, so now life is pretty simple, right? Let's just take all of these, you know, inflation rates, right, for these sectors, right, again, four-quarter change and four-quarter inflation, right, and look at the correlation between those and this activity measure, right? And you can see, right, sure enough, right, there's dif different correlations, right? So, you know, food services and accommodations is a restaurant, restaurants and hotels, right? It turns out, right, inflation in those sectors are pretty highly correlated with economic activity. So is food and beverages, right? Uh, so is housing, right? Uh, well, those are all well-measured sectors, right? And they're pretty highly correlated. Um, this is using, you know, band-passed versions, you know, uh, uh, business cycle uh, 
uh, smooth versions of these inflation measures, and you see roughly the same thing there. Okay, so great. So we got differential um, correlations. So then, uh, well, so then you just you run a regression. Okay, so, so that's what we're going to do here, right? So this is what we do. So we've got this cyclical activity index, right? And we want to ask, gee, is there some weighted average Right? Let's choose a weighted average of these inflation measures. Again, four quarter changes of four quarter inflation, right? Let's choose a weight, let's choose some weights so we have a weighted average of inflation so that that weighted average of inflation is as highly correlated as possible, right, with this measure of real activity, right, which is sort of cyclical activity, right? So we're going to find some WIs, right, to maximize the correlation, you know. We'll then form an index, right? So this is this cyclically sensitive inflation index, right? Where we've chosen the weights in this particular way, right? So that's all there are. You know, I guess we want these weights to be non-negative and sum to one, so it looks like, you know, it looks like a weighted average. Okay? So, you know, if you start doing this right, you kind of wonder how special, you know, we made some, you know. So what do we do if we're looking at a particular Y? particular measure of activity. We're looking at inflation constructed in a particular way, four quarter difference of four quarter inflation, right? You might ask, gee, are the results de dependent on that stuff, right? And the answer is no, right? So I'm not going to show you the results, but you know, you can look at alternative measures of infl alternative time series filters that you apply to inflation. Right? You could take the various elements that went into Y, you know, GDO, employment, unemployment, et cetera. You could handle them in different ways. You could put all of them in to this analysis and form a weighted average of economic activity that's as highly correlated as possible with a weighted average, right, of these inflation measures. So you got two sets of W's, right, and ask what happens. You could add leads and lags of this stuff, right, and ask what happens, and you kind of get the same results, okay? So, so none of these, this is kind of the simplest version, but you can see exactly what's going to happen uh, from this. Okay, boom. Well, this is what happens when you do this, right? These are these correlations that I showed you before, right? This is you know, what happens when you compute those Ws, so the, those weights and the weighted average are the numbers in the right column. In our sort of benchmark model, we left out the sectors where, you know, the prices were junk. Poorly measured, I think we, they're called. Okay? So we just left those out, right? We set those equal to zero. Turns out you could put them in and estimate them and ask what are their values. Turns out to be zero. Okay? So... Uh, so this is a constraint that really doesn't bind, but it made sense to impose it, right? So what do you see? Well, interestingly, right, you see you're putting a lot of weight on housing, right? Um, and on, uh, you know, so housing had a weight, right, a, a share in the PCE of about 17%. It's going about, to get about 60% of this weight, right? And, uh, you know, you got a bunch of weight on food and some on recreational services, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so what does this guy look like? Um, here's the, the black thing that's plotted there. Okay, the black curve. Oh, I'm sorry. And we did this estimation point, uh, post-1984. Post-1984 because, you know, when we looked at some of these inflation measures, right, uh, you know, the way they were measured kind of changed right in the mid-80s, right? So IR estimation period, you know, is here, okay? So, uh, so, uh, so the black thing there is the change in inflation, change in inflation, this CSI thing, and the blue thing, the blue dash thing is, uh, is the, uh, you know, the cyclical component of the unemployment rate, right? Uh, uh, and it looks like it's inverted, right? So the, uh, this measure, right, goes down a lot during recessions, right? So when it goes down, slack goes up. Okay, and, and what do you see? Well, you know, I don't know, the blue thing and the black thing look kind of correlated here, 
right? So that's the point, right? We try, we try to, in some sense, maximize the correlation between those, right? You can look in this early period, take this thing and just run it back, right? You can see they're correlated there, right? And at least to the eye, it's not clear they're more or less correlated here than they are there, right? So there's, you know, some stability, if you will, from this. And again, this is, I don't know, sort of, sort of out of sample, right? Because we didn't estimate the weights there. That's the CSI, right? So you see, you know, compared to the headline uh, PCE, which is in blue, or core PCE, which is in red, you know, you can see it behaves, well, somewhat differently, right? You can see somewhat differently, right? It's increased, you know, much more toward the end. I'll show you that, right, in just a second, right? It's got more cyclical variability in it. I guess that was the point, right? Okay. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna just, I guess, kind of wrap up with, a, with some pictures here, right? So uh, this is where we started, right? This was using core PCE, right? Steep, less steep, flat, right? Now use the PCE, well, you know, it's not as unstable. Still some instabilities there, right? But that's kind of what we got, right? Now, you know, I don't know, you know, change what you put on the x-axis. So instead of the unemployment rate, put the short-term unemployment rate, right? What do you get? Well, this is what you saw before, right? Again, you saw the flattening here, right? Changing what was on down here didn't matter, right? Here, right, you see somewhat less instabilities, right? So say you've gotten a little something out of this, right? These correlations, remember, right, they change pretty dramatically you know, so this is the same table that I showed you before, right? Correlations over these different periods, right? They changed from, you know, pretty, pretty big and negative here to pretty close to zero here, right? You see the changes aren't as big, right? So by focusing on these cyclically sensitive sectors, right, we've reduced, if you will, some of the instability in this Phillips correlation thing, right? And you can see that, you know, in the, in the slopes as well. Okay, so summarizing, uh, pretty easy paper. I mean, pretty, I mean, easy exercise, right? Try to reverse engineer something to see if you change, you know, regressing Y on X, what if I, and it looks unstable, what if I change Y? What if I change X, right? Can I make it more stable, right? That's what we've tried to do here, right? Changing the slack measure doesn't seem to do very much. Uh, uh, Cyclical behavior does vary a lot across these sectors. We knew it differed for forecasting reasons, and you know it also uh, differs here for correlation between uh, what's going on. Um, variation over the last years. Let me show you this final picture, two final pictures. So this is the picture that I started with, right? And that's the picture they ended up with. Right here, start, finish. I got two minutes left. I'm going to keep doing this. Okay? <laughs> okay? Uh, but you can see, right, sure enough, right, as the unemployment rate went down, if you will, right, the, right, this cyclically sensitive inflation, right, which was running at the beginning of the period, you know, um, uh, a, uh, uh, here, right, um, has uh, increased, right? It's now standing at about 2.7%, right? Whereas head, these headline measures are standing at about uh, 2%. If you compute this trend measure that I talked about, right? So compute some sort of long run average and some using all the data from all of these different 17 sectors, right? And ask where does that stand right now, right? Um, I did the calculation just before I left Princeton, right? It's standing now about 1.7%, right? So that would be kind of a trend value inflation. That's it. That's all I got. Thank you, Mark, very much for this presentation. <laughs> now we have uh, Ardias Bordone. Uh, she's a uh, vice president.
in the Macroeconomic and Monetary Studies function of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. She has taught at Princeton University and at Rutgers University. Her research is in the health of macro and monetary economics with a focus on the analysis of business cycle fluctuations. Her current research focuses on monetary policy and inflation dynamics. She received her PhD from the University of Chicago. You have uh, 15 minutes to give your comments. Thank you. participate in this conference and to discuss this paper and um, as all the other members of the uh, bank system, uh, I have to uh, clarify that the, whatever I say it doesn't reflect the uh, opinion of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or the Federal Reserve System. Okay, so, um, okay. so what's the question of the paper? Uh, it's uh, all the question of many papers in this, um, in this uh, conference. What happened to the Phillips curve as it faded, as it disappeared? The approach of, uh, of Mark and, and Jim is a, a kind of typical of their paper is an investigation. Uh, and they uh, end up exploiting the properties of subcomponent of the inflation index to try to uncover, as good detectives, a cyclically sensitive inflation. Uh, I think the paper is interesting, is somewhat, and I explain what somewhat means, novel. And I have some quibble and I'll ask a few questions. So the motivation you saw, uh, they actually start with two, uh, two figures, one for the, um, for the US and the other one for the um, Euro area. And the message is kind of the same, focus on a very deeply uh, downward uh, curve for the uh, unemployment and something relatively stationary for inflation, what happened to the Phillips curve. Okay, in a nutshell, the paper does, uh, three, so does two steps, two investigations. Number one, uh, it asks whether alternative measure of slack, so not just this unemployment measure that you have seen there, but alternative measure of slack restore the Phillips curve. And the answer is no. As you saw, the, there is a strong decline in correlation, whatever slack measure of, among the one consider you use, and the slope seems to be disappearing. And then they do a second investigation, uh, switching gears. Uh, and ask whether the uh, Phillips curve fails to show up because the data are noisy. And, the, and they say, yes, likely. There is a lot of heterogeneity in the response of the PC subcomponent to cyclical activity. And their idea is that to, to weight this, uh, very, this more cyclically um, sensitive component to construct this uh, cyclical effect. This is their idea. Uh, so the first investigation, you have seen the table. I don't want to bother you with more tables, but this is what they do. On the left, on the first column, there are all the various slack measure. Notice they are all variation of unemployment or employment output, uh, uh, employment population ratio. And then you s move uh, left to right, uh, you see that across periods the correlation is reduced, uh, the slope of the Phillips curve becomes almost insignificant. And so they move to the second step, which is uh, the construction of this uh, CSI. Um, you saw their, their table in which they say some of the, comp and you saw a lot of uh, entertaining um, digging into uh, the various components of a PCE. Um, in the, some of them are not really measured well, and so they just ignore, uh, judgmentally discard them. And then they uh, try to figure out which component matters for, acti for cyclical activity. So they have to construct an index of cyclical activities, uh, and this index is done, again, they take some of the series that we have seen before, they filter them in some similar way, and they extract the business cycle movement and then relate the, this business cycle movement in an aggregate of uh, activities uh, to the various subcomponent to get those weight W that you have seen for the construction of the, um, C, um, of the CSI, okay? So each subcomponent is related to the, to the uh, uh, cyclical activity index in terms of variation, and then they construct the CSI, okay? So this is the picture you have seen. Uh, focus on the difference between this black line and the two PCE, all um, um, variables or PCE, X food and energy, which is the red one, okay? Now, looking closely to this CSI, the most cyclically sensitive component are the services, and he has 
pointed out that there is a heavier weight attributed to the housing, it's about 63%, and something on food. The, those weights are very different from the weights in which uh, these components are weighted in the PCE, particularly uh, he mentioned exactly that the housing has about 16%, and um, uh, the food, I don't, I don't know exactly what it's, housing actually is 12%. Okay, so one, uh, uh, you see this table I emphasize, the two components that have higher weight. Um, the numbers are not exactly the one you have, so your table must have been updated, but, uh, but, the, but the message is the same. So here I see, if you see the latest uh, number here is 0.63, and this is 1.6, marked 0.65, you know, but the bottom line is the same. So these are the most important components. Now, um, there is an interesting feature in the PCE inflation, which is the decoupling of goods and services components around 2000. And this is most, more striking. So this you see here, there is a, these are PCE services and PCE good. And it's more striking if you look at PCE core goods and PCE core services. If you compute, and by the way, last night I was looking at the um, latest monetary policy uh, report, I think, of the Bank of Chile. And uh, there was, uh, in the part of inflation, I saw a picture very similar to this one. So also in Chile, you have an even actually bigger decoupling of the PC uh, services and good. I don't remember if I saw the core, but anyway. So here, I compute a rough correlation. The vertical bar is somewhat arbitrary. I cannot tell you where exactly the correlation change sign. But uh, up to 1999, the correlation between these two components of uh, uh, PCE were positive and large. And then they become negative. So in the recent period from 2000 to 2018, this is negative 0.34. So now, what will strike you? Now I put these two together with the CSI. What struck me looking at this picture is that the CSI is very close to the core services. And in fact, if I, uh, so the core services, the orange and CSI. Okay, so if I compute, uh, so the aligns quite well with the core services. Something that I, you know, ex ante I would know because the bigger component in the CSI is housing. But it, it holds for the aggregate of all services. Some religious services measure not too precisely, but still. Okay, so in fact, if you look at the correlation over time of the CSI uh, with the PCE good, in the first line, PCE goods, X food and energy, and PCE services, X energy. So these are the two core components. You see the correlation is higher for the whole period for the with the services, but then uh, declines a little bit for, th for the services going across some period, but it becomes negative with goods, which is, again, you expect once you have seen the behavior of core and services. Okay, now, that there, is, that there is a hidden Phillips curve uh, in, the, in the data. Uh, this is, a, gra this is a, 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 a measure that we compute at the Fed. Some of my colleagues actually compute at the Fed, which is an un estimate of an underlying inflation using uh, only the price, and this for CPI, using the uh, price sub subcomponent and using uh, many more data than just the price subcomponent. And so you see that the, 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 the coupling a little bit is not with current services, but yes. Uh, when you add the more information to just prices, uh, the uh, price index moves up. So that means that there is a hidden Phillips curve into this. Okay, this was a digression before telling what I uh, now do with this CSI. Okay, so their interpretation is CSI, and, and, and Mark was very clear, CSI is a signal that inflation can be used as a signal that inflation starts to pick up a cyclical condition tightened. And in fact, that's a logic under which it's constructed. Now, uh, given that it's a well justified, because the, given the uh, kind of uncertainty that we have about measuring the slack, this could be a good uh, you know, substitute for a measure of slack. But the question is, why do we care about slack? Do we care about slack because it, it helps explain inflation. So now I'm looking at the measure of inflation that tells me something about slack to know something about inflation. So why don't I use this inflation directly to understand this inflation measure, directly to understand inflation, which brings me to uh, the question. So is this CSI 
a forecasting tool for inflation. If it is, uh, it's like a core index. It's an exclusion index, excludes some component ex ante, judgmentally, rightly so, because they're poorly measured, and some other because they don't correlate it to economic activity. But so if it's a core measure, how does it compare with other core in terms of forecasting performance? So we know that the level we see. So uh, I don't pretend to give a lesson of forecasting to Mark, so I do a very rough exercise of forecasting, rough forecasting compo uh, comparison of CSI versus PCE core, O core, PCE core services, and the trimmed mean, the Dallas trimmed mean in the US is used, is considered one of the best core measures, okay? So I will focus on the bottom line because the bottom um, uh, graph, because that gives a comparison with the trimmed mean. So I would have expected that CSI would do similarly to the core services, okay? Forecasting four periods ahead, four, four quarters ahead means a year ahead, two years ahead, three years ahead. Instead, uh, running this horse race, uh, with no particular uh, uh, carefulness in the exercises, the pure you know, forecasting regression, uh, the PCE core forecast better. The CSI does not have a, you know, better forecasting power than this other measure of PCE. Okay, so we shouldn't use for forecasting. Some mm, quibbles in the last four minutes um, and some questions. Uh, the method to compute slacks and gaps. Um, now, I, I was puzzled, um, and, and I had to work a little bit to understand how this, um, what's the notion here? In the first part of the paper, remember what they do, they try to say, we have a slack, slack is supposed to uh, tell us something about where inflation is moving. I had to measure the slack. Um, the slack, in, in principle, is a deviation from, of, of a variable, say unemployment, from some full capacity, from the economy running at full capacity, but we don't know this full capacity variable. We don't know your star. Um, so what we do, often we use um, uh, some, we, they have to use some, some way of computing, and so they use uh, some filtering, right? You know, two-sided filtering and so on. In the second part of the paper, they have to measure a gap between the variable uh, during the cycle from the trend. So it's like an inverse of the, of the slack, right? But, um, but they use a different way of computing. It's still a filtering, but now it's more focused on filtering out the regular component and the, um, and the long, low frequency component. So I'm, and this is a question really, and I'm not sure whether we know exactly how well we have to approximate the capacity utilization with the trend or not. So this, I, I leave this question open. And then um, the last question that is, I guess, closer to my heart, uh, the choice of real activity variables to measure gaps in Slack are all unemployment, unemployment for a short-term unemployment, or, uh, unemployment, uh, employment population ratio variables. Say, what, what about a measure of labor cost? You know, we have seen Matteo, I think, uh, talking a lot about the labor share. And when I think about a Phillips curve, I think about the labor share as a measure, however imperfect, uh, of the unit, real unit labor cost that should tell us something about inflation, more than unemployment and a, a gap of any kind, because remember, in order to get to, from the labor cost to the unemployment, you have to have all sorts of other assumptions in the model, but, but it's more direct to have uh, inflation with labor costs. Okay, and labor costs is a lot of variation. So this is, uh, this is from one of the, my papers. Um, this is the labor share, and there is a trend in the labor share. This is particularly extracted with the, as a beverage Nelson trend. So it's infinite horizon forecast from a multivariate uh, VAR. And so you see that uh, there is a lot of uh, cyclical variability in the trend, in the, in the labor share, and this should be informative about the cycle. And it's not necessarily true that uh, the labor share and inflation are uncorrelated. You have to think about deviation from trends, so cyclical component of labor share. And uh, okay, and I think uh, uh, okay, and I think this brings me to uh, the last slide. Um, back to the aggregate Phillips curve 
how do, we, how do I interpret this CSI in the context of the Phillips curve? Well, I already told you, you had to take into account the labor share, but um, CSI picks up, as I think I, I show you, largely service inflation, and that suggests that when you think about the Phillips curve, we have to model differently a sector of services and a sector of, of goods. And there are very good reasons to do that, and people in this room have done uh, this. Um, the goods inflation are more sensitive to competition from abroad, so there is a whole e issue that those days is investigated a lot about the market structure in which the firm operates has a lot to do with the way in which it prices and the way in which, therefore, the costs translate or don't translate in, uh, in prices or absorption or through markup. This is some discussion we have had. Um, and, uh, and the other thing, uh, and so you, the Phillips curve, maybe there is no Phillips curve. There are Phillips curve at least for large sector of the economy. And then, um, you know, to go from this as a Phillips curve, we need to take into account of inflation expectations, something that, again, is scripted in, in some of the discussion, but often when we consider this contemporaneous Phillips curve gets completely uh, forgotten. Thank you. Thank you, RJ, very much for your comment. Now we have uh, 10 minutes for a uh, for question from the public. So raise your hand here. Yeah, Oscar. So, <laughs> uh, I, I enjoyed the talk, and I've, I've seen a version of this that, that Jim presented at, at San Francisco, which we've incorporated into our thinking. Uh, but in seeing your presentation again, it made me wonder, have you tried to do this with the IS curve and thinking about the sensitivity of each of these sectors to interest rates? Because presumably, if you compare housing to healthcare, if I were to be a policymaker and I had to defend what's going on with inflation, if there was a spike in healthcare due to some new piece of legislation, that's completely unrelated with demand, I would say, well, look, you know, inflation picked up this month or the next because this new piece of legislation on Medicare has affected drug prices, and who cares? But if housing prices have gone up, then that seems to fall squarely in my purview as a policymaker. And so I would want to know, when I want to concentrate on those sectors that are more sensitive to inflation, because that's what the public is going to judge me for. I just wanted to make one remark on the, on the nonprofit institution serving households. I think Mark's presentation didn't do justice to ministers whose religious services have some real good quality. NISH also contains political parties, and there we have many more quabbles over the quality adjusted prices. So I think. Uh... Yeah, um, now you, you, you choose to focus on. on and to, to look at the optimal weight, weights on different inf sectoral inflation measures and to maximize the correlation with uh, your measure of aggregate slack. But you could have done the dual somehow, not take uh, sectoral measures of slack and, and look for the weights that maximize that correlation. And you could do both simultaneously. I mean, it depends, depending on the goal. If, if the goal is, was to forecast inflation, uh, um, I think it would be better to do this dual approach instead, no? What you're interested in is forecasting actual inflation, not... Uh... I, I think our GM sort of mentioned this, but m maybe more focused. So, so is it sort of like in the column where you have the weight, say the CPI and then the weights you end up, are they sort of the change on them or, or let me put it this way, the way that you end up using, are they kind of uh, basically very much correlated with the frequency of price changes? So if you were to look at each of the sector, I mean, services we know, so that's why I'm wondering, I'm wondering whether this is like the cap, sort of like whether these are the sectors are more stickier and then these are the ones which are better candidates to kind of have the demand logic type. I have this table, I'll present it tomorrow. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> <I have> question. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, we are
we have uh, six minutes, so. <laughs> uh, so getting to Fernando's, could you send me that too? Uh, so I don't know, I didn't know the answer to his question, so I would love to. So this is based on Bill San Clino. Um, so uh, according to them, uh, when you look at services, that uh, the weight is around 30%. The frequency, the monthly frequency of price changes with services is around 15%. It's pretty low. And when you look at processed or unprocessed food, in the case of unprocessed food, it, the frequency is close to 50%. So there's a very sizable difference in the frequency across sectors yeah. in the line that you would expect. It's stickier, the sectors uh, that's close to services. Good, good, good. Okay. So let me just, uh, let me just make a few comments. Um, you know, I think... Um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, what I learned from this exercise, and I guess it's sort of, it's sort of obvious, but it's, it, it was useful to do the calculations, right? Um, you know, sectoral inflations behave differently, and um, if you're thinking about forecasting future inflation, it turns out to pay to, to look at the different sectors. You know, that's, um, that's a result that you know, people have known and that, that uh, you know, Jim and I tried to quantify in a, in a recent paper. You know, here we were trying to, you know, the sort of the puzzle here was this, was this flattening of the Phillips correlation, right? So, so that's kind of why we focused on that and not on the forecasting per se, although I realize, you know, why, why one might be interested in that is, you know, is the forecasting thing. Um, um, it is, it is interesting here, I, you know, roughly 60% 60, 60 of this weight, you know, was on housing, a reasonably well-measured series, a very important series, you know, over, I mean, a, a reasonably important series overall, right, in the PCE, 16%, much more important if you limit the PCE to services. So it's not too surprising that if you look at core services, I'm not quite sure what core services are. Does that just take out energy? Okay, so that just take, so that just takes out the energy component of housing, sir. Housing, housing has an energy component that's about that's about one eighth, I think, of the housing bit, and uh, right, and then the rest of it is is what we would put a lot of weight on. So, so it's not sorry. Now there are a lot of these services that are not particularly well measured. Uh, I guess political uh, contribution is one thing that might be well measured if you use the hedonic regression or something. Um, but in, in any event, um, uh, so, so this this sort of sectoral stuff um, is important. Um, uh, getting to Jordy's comment, right? It it would be it, one of the things we had kind of thought about doing, you know, here, right? If we had done uh, a bit more work, was to do an exercise of the sort that you did. Now we did an exercise, sort of like here, and we took these slack measures and looked at weighted averages of those. But that's different than looking at sort of sectoral activity and building up that way. And that that is that is an interesting calculation and certainly well worth well worth doing. Um, you know, to Oscar's comment about interest rate sensitivity, I I understand. Yeah, I mean, we just haven't done that. That's an interesting. I, you guys have probably done that. I suspect. Any good central bank has done that calculation. Uh, they've done it here. I, I should say, you know, as our Gia pointed out, this sort of cyclically sensitive inflation thing that we did for the United States, you know, here at the at the Central Bank of Chile, I learned this week that, you know, they essentially have a measure like that. They call it core core, right? So it's, you know, let's get rid of food and energy and then let's think. I think they've done it judgmentally, right? But let's think about, you know, the, the sectors that, you know, so aren't traded goods and that are measured well, right? And then have constructed, right, an index I think that they think is pretty useful for thinking about, you know, the problems that they face. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it there. Um, there's more, but I would have to stare at these pages for a while. Okay. Thank you very much for presentations. And... And don't don't move from your seats because next session start start immediately.
evidence from producer prices and industry level output. The work was co authored by Simon Gilchrist and Egon Sakrasek, is it correct? <laughs> Simon Gilchrist is a professor of economics at the New York University and research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. His research interests relate to monetary economics and applied macroeconomics. Much of his research focuses on the consequences of financial market turmoil and its impact on real economic activity, with particular focus on the implication for investment behavior, business cycle dynamics, and the conduct of monetary policy. He holds a PhD from University of Wisconsin. Please, Simon, we have 35 minutes for you. Thank you. <laughs> Is there a clicker? This? Okay, great. Um, okay, so the, the, the title is a little different. Um, uh, does this, okay, can I go back? Okay, good. Um, uh, so uh, we are gonna look at, think about flattening of the Phillips curve, but uh, we're gonna take a particular take on this, which is how does that relate to trade exposure? So, um, so this is joint work with Egon Sakrajic. Okay, so um, uh, so you know we've heard the motivation uh, throughout the day of uh, the Great Recession suggested a missing deflation, and then the recent recovery suggests a missing inflation. Um, I've worked as as you know Oscar mentioned earlier on on theories as to why we might see missing deflation during the Great Recession, um, but um, in generally there's this weakening of uh, apparent weakening of inflation and economic activity over time. And, you know, I, I don't think that my specific explanation for, say, the recession is something that would necessarily explain that, right? So I'm going to explore another, another avenue. Um, and as we've discussed throughout the day, and um, Oscar made very clear, um, one possibility is that the conduct of monetary policy has changed, and, and that's resulted in the disappearance of the traditional Phillips curve because policy is actually behaving better than it otherwise would. Um, another common theme in the literature is the extent of globalization, and um, uh, that reflected the comments of the governor this morning, and then other comments throughout the day, too, and, and some of what RGA was saying. So. Um, Okay, so we're going to focus on this issue of trade and globalization, and my motivation, in part, I got onto this topic a little bit because I was asked to discuss a paper at the BIS by Kirsten Forbes it's this summer, and so I thought it was an interesting question. Um, so there's sort of different takes on this that you can think about, and, and it's sort of debated in the literature, so, um, and, and Larry Ball has a very nice paper on this, which is well cited back in 2006. Um, so you could think that maybe globalization led to increased competition and more price flexibility and therefore a steeper Phillips curve in some way. And Argia has a nice paper exploring kind of competition in a uh, global environment. Um, but you can also ask the question, well, you know, once you sort of recognize that there's traded goods out there and there's other forms of um, activity that comes from abroad, how might that affect the slope of the Phillips curve condition on the degree of price rigidity? And so, um, increased openness, in some sense, is going to reduce the response to the output gap in the New Keynesian model. And, and one way to think about this is sort of a measurement issue regarding marginal cost. Okay, so we're not fully reflecting the marginal cost when we're just looking at the output gap. Okay, so um, and and sort of the, the the cost pressures that are coming from from the, the global environment are aren't specifically related to uh, the local environment. Say. Okay, and then there's a recent uh, evidence on this. So Larry has a paper, there was a sort of famous, he gets famously quoted as saying no, no, and no to three questions about globalization. So um, Bordeaux and Filardo sort of think about things like, well, could I put global slack into Phillips curves at the country level and, and find something? And Kristen Forbes, I, I summarized her paper as saying, well, it looks like global factors have become more important, um, but they really become more important for, um, CPI inflation, headline inflation, but actually less important for core inflation. So, um, so you know, I think the evidence here is sort of mixed on this topic. So. Um, 
Okay, so uh, today I'm going to talk about, I'm going to first look at aggregate data, and, and in some sense it's going to look very much like what um, Mark Watson showed you. I'm going to sort of estimate some Phillips curves and show you how they're moving over time. And then I'm going to explicitly relate that to uh, trade shares in the U.S. economy and say how much of this flattening would correlate with the observed trade shares that we see in, in this very specific exercise, okay? But then I think the sort of what's uh, particularly novel then is we're going to go to industry level data and, 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 and again we've seen, you know, Mark's example of the richness of industry data and, and Bart's is, is um, a good introduction to this is we're going we're gonna to use um, uh, very narrowly defined six digit industries, okay? So, you know, if you look at like the, the glass industry, like that's at the four digit or something, and the six digit there's like flat glass, there's blown glass, there's glass used to make other glass. There, you know, like it's pretty narrow, right? So there's like flour milled um, and corn milled, and you know, so so pretty detailed stuff. Um, so uh, and this is the data that underlies the PPI and underlies the industrial production index that the board produces as well. So um, and it's not really commonly used outside of the board, so it's sort of a, a nice to have hold of this data. Um, so we're going to examine sort of the um, price output response to the industry level, okay? And then, um, and what's nice about the industry level data, we can also link it to trade shares. The trade shares are going to be computed at the four digit, not the six digit level, but that's still pretty narrow. Okay, so we can examine trade exposure using this industry level data. And, you know, one of the nice things about the industry level data is it doesn't suffer from this critique of, well, there's been changing monetary policy that's kind of flattened something because I'm going to take out the aggregate variation and just be looking at the industry responses, okay? So, um, but nonetheless, it is going to suffer from the fact that it's not an identified shock when we run a regression, okay? So it's going to be a mixture of supply and demand and things like that. I'm not going to attempt any identification at the industry level. But instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn to a factor um, vector autoregression analysis and say, let me sort of have an exercise where I think I can pretty plausibly look at something that looks like a demand shock in the aggregate U.S. economy and then trace out its effect on this industry level data. And in particular, I'm going to split between um, trade intensive industries and, and less trade intensive industries and use that as sort of a way to sort of trace out a demand shock, okay? And I also, we can do that for commodity price shocks, and I think that's kind of interesting, too. So, so that's sort of where we're going with this. So, um, Okay, so, um, so we're going to look at both CPI and then the PPI. And, and the PPI, um, because it, it does reflect the underlying microdata uh, that we're using directly. So, but, you know, these are familiar indices. Um, the core, um, uh, the blue is um, headline, and then the red is core. And then the, for the producer price index, the core only starts in 1974, so there's a little bit of a sample difference here. But otherwise, we're going, all of our regressions are going to start in like 1960. Um, and then in terms of economic slack, we're going to use two slack measures, and they come straight out of uh, the FRB US model at the Board of Governors, okay? So, um, so one is going to be um, the output gap, which is output measured relative to potential, as implied by Furbis model. And, that's nice because the, the potential output is incorporating TFP and capital and things like that, and really sort of the underlying movements that you'd expect out of the real business cycle core of that model, okay? So, so there's gonna be, um, so that's the red dashed line is the output gap, so the log deviation of output from that potential. And then we're also gonna use the unemployment gap, which is unemployment relative to some natural rate that's also embedded in that model. And, um, Okay, so, and they obviously co-move in opposite directions, um, and, and so those are going to be our two slack measures. And I think it's sort of nice to actually use the things that the policymakers are looking at as sort of slack measures as well. So, um, okay, so we're just going to estimate, um, so, so one thing before I get into the data, I want to kind of highlight, this is one way of looking at why kind of studying inflation is, is, is a hard object, I think, to do, okay? And so here what I've done is I've taken all of the, um, uh, the producer prices, the core producer prices, and then the core consumer prices, and then real GDP, and I've plotted um, their deviation from a, from a stochastic trend using the, a sort of recent paper by Hamilton where we compute this, just around each recession date, okay? So, 
Um, this is sort of real GDP. This is, you know, the recession starts here, and real GDP is declining across all these periods, right? So that's a recession. Now, when you look at the, the price measures, it's really no, by no means obvious that those things are declining relative to their trend uniformly across these recession periods, okay? So, um, and, um, uh, and, and, you know, I've also done this in a different way of just, say, uh, take the linear trend in the price level, say, over the three years prior to each recession, and then plot where you go from there, and it's sort of rare that we actually sort of go below that trend and, and around the recession, so... Um, so, you know, so, so this lack of sort of um, responsiveness, um, uh, in, in some way, although it's become much more apparent, around recessions is actually fairly persist, you know, consistent across different episodes. So. Um, okay. Um, and I will say in the paper, we actually asked the question about asymmetry. So where does the inflation pressure come from? And it really just comes from the boom periods, not the, not the recession periods. And so... Um, I'm not going to talk about that today, but I think that that's something fruitful to think about for future research. Sort of, you know, in a downturn, do we really see sort of deflationary pressures, or is it really just in the upturn that we see the positive inflationary pressures? So. Um, okay, so um, we're going to do something very simple. I don't want you to think about this as structural, as Oscar emphasized quite nicely. Um, but we're going to regress, say, uh, at either a one quarter ahead or a four quarter ahead um, price change on an output gap measure and some lags, okay? So the output gap will be either the, um, uh, this output relative to potential or this unemployment gap. Um, and again, our sample is 62 to 2017, except for the core, which is available later. Okay, so these are sort of the regression coefficients that you get on these things. They actually look um, very nice. This is produce, so this is producer prices, the top is um, all producer prices, and then this is core, so X food and energy. But you get a very nice systematically positive relationship between the output gap today and inflation either tomorrow or year ahead. And similarly, for the unemployment gap, there's a, there's a negative relationship. Um, I think it's sort of much more robustly estimated it with core PPI than it is with um, headline PPI, but it's very strongly there in the data, okay? So... Um, so over this full sample from 1960, it looks like we have this sort of nice relationship. Um, similarly, if you were to do the CPI inflation, um, uh, you see a very similar pattern, um, very strong positive coefficients on the output gap and very strong negative coefficients on the unemployment gap. Um, and, um, and, you know, the magnitudes of these things are, you know, on the order of 0.25, 0.3, and that contrasts starkly with, say, the estimates that Oscar was sort of mentioning of 0.03 on an output term, right? So, um, okay. Um, so now, um, what we can do now is now say, okay, how robust are these? And we have some sort of, um, you know, criterion for um, constancy of coefficients over time, and you would strongly reject them, and we pick break dates and things like that. Uh, that's in the paper, but I think this is sort of the very informative exercise is to just say, let me just run 15-year uh, window rolling regressions and report the coefficients from these regressions, okay? And so um, these are the time-bearing coefficients for the output gap, um, producer prices, core producer prices, consumer prices, core consumer prices, and it's very clear and uniform across all of these inflation measures that there's this very strong... Um, relationship that you get in the early part of the sample period, positive relationship between output gaps and inflation, and then that that's essentially uh, disappearing substantially. Um, it is actually recovering a little bit in the later sample period, which maybe is good news for some people, but, um, but there's this clear flattening going on, right? And that's consistent with what Mark was showing. Um, if you did the unemployment gap, you would see a very similar pattern here. So um, uh, a little less monotonic, but you know, in this later sample period, there's almost no relationship between inflation and unemployment. Um, okay. Um, so now a question is, to what extent to, um, can the trade um, sort of globalization story help us understand this? And, um, you know, so, so when we look at this, there's, there's sort of, you know, clearly a downward trend. Um, 
And how can we relate this to sort of uh, rising globalization? So, um, and, uh, so here we're going to just take the U.S. trade share, and, and this is um, the sum of exports plus imports divided by GDP. So, um, so that's you know varied substantially, starting at 10% in the early sample period, up to 30% now. Okay, so. Um, so that's a, you know, a fairly steady trend over time, so it's clearly not going to capture all of that variation in those coefficients that I, that I showed you, but nonetheless, we can sort of interact this with the output gap or the unemployment slack measure and see how far that would get you. Okay? And again, I don't want to you know, necessarily think about this as causal, but just sort of an exploratory device. right? And, um, and this is actually a regression that Larry Ball ran in, in his paper. So, um, okay, so when you do that, um, this, I'm just going to show you it for core, um, um, for, for core output, and then um, and then the core output times the trade share, or um, unemployment, and then unemployment times the trade share. Okay, so then what you're going to see is that we're going to get um, a much bigger sort of coefficient, 0.9 instead of 0.3 on the output gap, but then this negative response to the trade share of minus 0.03. Okay, and then minus 0.03 times a trade share at the end of the sample period essentially brings you down to zero on the, on the total coefficient on the output gap, okay, or close to zero. So, um, so this is highly statistically significant in, in core PPI, um, this interaction term. Um, if you looked at the PPI, you also get a very similar pattern, which is that this interaction term again comes in very strongly and statistically significant. Okay, so there is some systematic relationship between this sort of rising share and then this falling coefficient. Now, they're both trending, so I'm not going to make too much out of that. And Mark is waving his hands this way and that way at me to sort of say, you know, let's be cautious here. But, um, uh, but nonetheless, I can just say, suppose I took the fitted value, the implied value of this coefficient on the total output gap, for example, and how well would that do, right? And so um, this is the dashed red line here, okay? So, um, and you know, it's, it's doing pretty well. It's not gonna get all of this decline, right? And particularly, it doesn't get the decline in the early sample period, but, um, but you know, I think there's an argument to be made that maybe there is some component of increased um, exposure to trade that's, that's doing something here, okay? And, um, all right. Um, Okay, so, th so that's sort of at the macro level, and that's, I think, really as much as we can say. So now let's go to the industry level data. So um, as I said, we're going to have this detailed industry level data set. Um, so we actually have data, it goes back to the uh, mid-1970s for um, a subset of the industries, and then um, around the mid-1980s, we see a very big expansion of the number of industries covered. Okay, so we're going to really start our sample in the mid-1980s, 1984, all right? And, but there, in the mid-1980s, what we see is um, the industrial production in the price series, okay? But then, um, starting in 1990, we also see uh, w wages and employment as well, so that's very nice. And so, it turns out from 1990 onwards, we can construct a balance panel of 185 industries where we have information on prices, wages, employment, and um, uh, output at the six-digit industry level. Okay, so I think that this is a, a, there's lots more to be done with this data set, I think, given the fineness of detail that we have, so. Um, okay, and then as I said, we're gonna augment this with four-digit, um, at the four-digit level, we can get export, imports, and shipments, and then we can construct a trade exposure. And, Again, our trade exposure measure is going to be the sum of exports and imports divided by the shipments here. Okay, all right. Um, and and this was actually surprisingly more work uh, for Egon than he anticipated. So, um, okay. Um, all right. So this is the data then. So um, here I'm I'm showing you sort of the 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 red or the black line is the median growth. This is um, output on the on the top, and then the um, inflation on the bottom, and the, the black line is the median in any given period across all these industries, and then the, the blue shaded area shows you the interquartile range across these industries for both output growth and prices, 
And then um, we're also plotting the aggregates that you would get from um, US data. So that's the red dash line. And, and so you know, this data, not surprisingly, reflects what's going on in industrial production in the PPI in terms of the aggregate. Um, and um, you know, there's a lot of variability in, in output. And then you can see sort of the inflation measure here. Okay, so. Um, and now we're also going to, I'm going to do some exercises in the favor. We're going to estimate the favor, but then I'm going to construct a pseudo aggregate off of the favor by using employment shares as weights for each industry to get a price series. And that looks kind of like a cross somewhere between like the core PPI and the non core PPI, in fact. And I think it's got some food stuff in there that wouldn't otherwise show up in core. But, um, but that aggregation looks pretty good. So that's what I'll use for aggregation. Um, OK, so, um, so now I'm going to estimate an industry level uh, regression of a change in the log price on, on an on a activity measure and some lags. And here I'm going to exploit the panel dimension. I'm going to include fixed effects to control for average differences in inflation across industries. And I'm also going to put in the, the full set of time dummies, so we're going to identify fully off of the industry variation and not off of any common macro component. Okay, now it turns out that that doesn't really drive things in terms of the industry regression, so whether or not I control for those time dummies or not isn't such a big deal. But um, okay, and then our activity measures, I'm either going to use the year over year change in uh, industry output or I'm going to use output relative to a stochastic trend. And, and we're going to use Jim Hamilton's latest thing, which he assures me is better than a Hodrick Prescott filter for a variety of reasons. So, um, so that would be another measure. Okay. And, then, um, and then we'll split the sample between high trade intensity versus low trade intensity industries. And here, all I'm going to do is I'm going to take the sample and compute the employment weighted median and just split right there. So half of the sample is um, represents 50% of employment and the other half 50% of employment. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so these are the industry level estimates. So this is going to be um, column one is a regression of, say, um, and this is all four quarter employment or inflation uh, that we're looking at now. So four quarter head inflation on an output gap measure or an um, output growth measure. Um, strongly statistically significant, um, not much in terms of the inflation lags, um, and, but the coefficients are very small, right? So they're about one-tenth the magnitude of what we were seeing in the aggregate over that full 1960 sample period. But they're actually very representative of the, of the coefficients that you would estimate in the aggregate over the sample period for which we have the data. So they actually don't look that different from, from the aggregate estimates in that sense, okay? Um, now here, what I've done is a full sample, 84 to 2017, and then in the aggregate, really you saw the flattening, the Phillips curve really kick in, and it was fully there by sort of the you know, early, um, uh, late 1990s. We'd really sort of hit kind of zero, you know, very close to zero coefficients, and so it sort of makes sense to say, well, what happens from 1998 onwards? Do we see a big flattening, okay? And, and in, in, in fact, you don't really see any evidence of flattening in this industry level data, okay? So now that's not the same thing as saying that the aggregate Phillips curve hasn't become flatter, but it, um, and, and this actually might, you know, point more to a story about monetary policy or something like that, right, that the aggregate, but, um, okay. Um, but those coefficients look fairly stable. All right, so now um, let's look at the balance panel, and here I just wanna, um, uh, where I'm going to split by low trade share and high trade share. Everything now is going to be from the balance panel because I'm going to do the favor in the balance panel as well. Okay, and I can also do the weighted versus the unweighted estimates as well. So the weighted estimates are going to be weighted each industry by its employment share, and that's sort of more representative of what I might expect to see in the aggregate data, right? So, um, and so here for the unweighted estimates, I'm just going to talk about the output gap coefficients. Unweighted is coefficient of 0.025 over the sample period, so very similar to what we had before. Uh, when you do the weighted estimates, um, you know, it is substantially lower, and, and you know, the precision is about the same, so it's becoming statistically insignificant. Um, but then you know, here's sort of the story, which is that when you split by low trade share and high trade share in this data, what you really see is that the low trade share 
um, industries, so industries, and, and this isn't a very big trade share, by the way, it's like something like 0.05, okay, is the median here, so. Um, but industries that aren't really um, at all traded, uh, they show a strong responsiveness of, of industry prices to industry output, but when you start to see the high trade share industries, then it's much, much weaker, okay? So, you know, it's still there, it's significant in the unweighted, but the coefficient falls in half, and then in the weighted regressions, it basically goes to zero. Okay, so, so again, this is evidence, I think, that you know, trade matters for how sensitive prices might be to fluctuations in output. Okay, so, um, and this is off of entirely different variation than what we saw in the aggregate data. All right? Okay, so, um, so, to, so to summary, so industry-level response coefficients of similar, similar magnitudes, the aggregates, the industry-level estimates show no evidence of attenuation. Um, the price response to output is twice as large in the low-trade industries versus the high-trade industries. But then, you know, in terms of identification, this is just a regression, so we're mixing supply shocks and demand shocks. And, you know, at the industry level, both of these things could be very big forces going on. Um, you know, technological change versus demand and things like that, right? And so, so now we really want to think a little bit more about identification, and this is how we're going to use, uh, we're going to go to the sort of factor vector autoregression to get that identification. Okay, so the favor, we're going to do this in the following way. It reflects some earlier stuff I did with credit data, but if you know sort of um, Elias, or Bovant, Elias, and Bernanke's paper on sort of using favors to sort of estimate the effect of monetary policy. It's kind of a similar, similar structure. So, so we're going to split this sort of data. So there's observable data X. And we're going to split it into two components, X1 and X2. X1 is going to be all of our industry variables. So it's going to be for each industry, we have these four variables, inflation, output, wages, and prices, um, or employment. And I've got 185 of those industries. So there's 750 series there or something in X1. And X2 is going to be some aggregate time series where I'm going to identify a shock off of that, okay? And so, um, and, and then it's going to be a factor structure, and then there's going to be some factor loadings. And the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to sort of identify a set of factors F1 purely off of X1, okay? And then I'm going to take those factors F1, I'm going to regress X2 on those factors, remove that information, this coming from X1 in terms of X2, and then get a new set of factors off of those residuals that are left over in X2, and then I'm gonna shock that residual factor F2, the first principal component of that, okay? And that's gonna be my identified shock. So it's a Koleski-style um, analysis, um, um, and, um, and, you know, and, and, and equivalently that's imposing that um, these factor loadings in that upper left corner are zero, okay? So we're gonna impose that. So, okay, so X1 is the industry level data, and then for my demand shock, I'm gonna look at a financial shock, and why? Because I know this works very well in terms of moving aggregate output and stuff like that based on my uh, past work. But I'm just gonna take an index of financial series. They're all um, market-based series. Um, so credit spreads uh, is constructed by Egon and I, an excess bond premium that we construct the BAA, AAA spread, the term spread on the Treasury, and then the VIX. So all of those are, are you know, market-based and moving very quickly, and I think that's nice. And so those are going to be in X2, and I'm just going to take the first principal component of that, okay, as a, and shock that, okay. But those have already been orthogonalized relative to X1. Okay, so, um, so this is the impulse response to this financial conditions index, if you will, okay? So it's going to be a tightening of the financial conditions. And um, the red line that you see is the median response across all industries here, okay? And the unweighted median response. And then the dark blue is sort of the interquartile range, and then the light blue is the 95th to 5th percentile range. And so, you know, producer price inflation is falling, Industrial production is falling. These are all the, just the growth rates, so I'm not leveling these up, okay? Um, and employment growth is falling, and then there's some slackening in the wages, okay? So, you know, output and prices are moving in the same direction, and it very much looks like a demand shock in that sense, okay? All right. Um, now, um, now what we can do is now we can say, 
okay, let's split by high versus low trade industries, okay? And to do this, to make sure I'm not sort of const artificially constraining the factor structure to be the same across these industries, I'm just gonna redo the favor for the high trade intensity industries and the low trade intensity industries and then conduct the same shock. And I could show you that sort of, the, you know, those pictures of all the industries, but I'm just gonna now show you the, the weighted aggregate responses where w across these industries weighted by employment, okay? So, um, so the, the black line here shows you the weighted aggregate response to all industries, okay? And so this is, again, a demand, um, uh, Right? No, I'm sorry. I think I I think this is a commodity price shock. Yeah. Um Let me see. I think this is a commodity price shock, because I, uh, yeah, because output, yeah. So um, you have to look in the paper, I apologize for this. It's sort of like, it got mislabeled somehow in the figures. But, but basically what's going on is that the, um, if you looked at the, the output responses all look the same, and the wage responses, the employment responses all look the same, but there's a big difference in the price response, and the price response to the tr non-traded, or the low-traded guys, is three times larger than the price response of the traded guys, okay? So there's a nice picture in the paper that shows you that, okay, and apologies here. So, um, okay, so, so that clearly indicates in the data that there's much more sensitivity of prices to output in response to demand shocks for these industries that are not exposed to trade, okay? And one nice way to summarize that, and this is the correct plot, is to compute the implied price elasticity to output at different horizons for the low versus the high trade guys. So I, all I do is that for each horizon, just accumulate up how much the price moved and then divide that by the accumulated amount that the output moved, okay? And here you can see that the price elasticity, you know, this is for the full sample, it's about, you know, after 10 quarters, about 0.75. It's, you know, one, almost 1.2, one for the low trade guys, so prices for every 1% movement in output, prices are moving by 1.2%. And then for the high trade guys, it's more something on the order of 0.3. So it's, it's literally less than a third the response, okay? The, the price elasticity to output that's coming out of this data, okay? So I think that that really does make the case that, you know, there's something different going on in the tradable goods industries in terms of how their inflation is responding over the cycle to demand shock. Um, okay, and then um, similarly, I can do the commodity price shocks, and here what we do is I take the X2 index and I replace it by, um, take out the, the financial variables and just put in a series of 10 commodity prices that make up the aggregate commodity price index, okay? And um, again, do the same identification procedure. Um, uh, yeah, and so this is uh, where you see sort of prices are rising, and industrial output is falling, okay, in response to this shock. Um, it's not completely clean because there's a little bit of an employment response early on, which is positive rather than negative. But if you sum these up, it's clear that the, the output decline is, you know, there's a strong output decline and a strong positive price increase. So it looks like a supply shock in that sense, okay? And again, you can do the aggregate response effects. And again, what you're gonna see is that the the industrial output response to the shock across these industries looks exactly the same. So high trade versus low trade. So it's not about one being more exposed to these commodity prices than the other in terms of the output, right? But again, you see there's strong differentiation in terms of the price response and that the low trade industries, their prices are responding by three times as much as the high trade industries in response to this commodity price as well, okay? so. Um, again, there seems to be much more responsiveness going on in these industries that are not exposed to trade. Okay, um, okay so um, let me just conclude. 
So aggregate Phillips curves est estimates show strong attenuation in response to economic slack over time. I don't think that's a big surprise to anybody in this room. Um, a significant component of this attenuation occurs in conjunction with the rising trade shares. Um, I'm not going to make too big of a deal out of that in terms of causation, but it just suggests that there's a possibility of something that we might be able to explain. But then I think in terms of the industry level data, that that's providing us robust evidence that indeed price responses for output is substantially mitigated in the industries that face the higher trade exposure. So. Thank you very much, Simon. Now I have to present you Eduardo Silverman, who will be the discussant uh, of this paper. He's a senior economist at the Economic Research Department, Monetary Policy Division of the Central Bank. He holds a PhD uh, from the New York University. So, uh, so thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Jordi, Gonzalo, Diego. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here commenting such a good paper. I mean, I'm new in the bank, so I should have written that the views are mine, not those of the bank. Uh, so I think it's hard to overemphasize the importance of the topic of the paper and the theme of the conference in general. If you Google uh, Phillips Curves Alive, or Phillips curve is that you got like probably a, a, a record for the profession of 4,000 results. Uh, the debate was busted during the Great Des uh, Recession because of the deep missing deflation we observed in the US. And perhaps the missing de deflation debate overshadowed the potential more structural role of the expansion in the international trade we, we observed recently. Uh, there was incipient literature that was hit by the onset of the Great Recession, and that paper speaks to this literature by showing that international trade weakened the relationship between inflation and economic activity in the U.S. And the authors do that uh, by showing a, vi a variety of evidence, aggregate, aggregate time series estimation of the Phillips curve, industry level estimation, of the Phillips curve and evidence from uh, identified uh, FAVAR. So I'm going over uh, some comments uh, on this, but before I'd like to propose a framework to organize our, our uh, idea. So I took the te textbook, the Canadian model from Jordi's book. And the Phillips curve dynamics in the closed and the small open economies are exactly the same except for the coefficient the author, uh, uh, the, the paper is interested in. In the small economy extension, you have that composite between domestic and foreign goods. Here I'm assuming that the elasticity of substitution between them is one. And that parameter new can be interpreted as a measure of openness. I think what is nice about this version is that the closed economy is nested in the small open economy one. So if nu is equal to zero, we got the same dynamics in both economies. And the key insight that I think it's useful to, to, to read the results of the paper is that if the utility function has enough curvature, you are going to observe a flattening of the, the Phillips curve as the degree of openness uh, evolves. Uh, please, of course, here uh, uh, the connection is not direct because the US, of course, not a small open economy, but this is just a first glance between, compared between uh, empirics and, uh, and theory. So, of course, given that expansion of uh, the, the, uh, the international uh, the, the trade share through the lens of the baseline or Canadian model, we should expect some flattening uh, of the Phillips curve over time. And once you interact that trade share with measures of output gap, that's what uh, Simon found in, in, in the paper. Uh, of course, any series with a steady thread might do that job. So, in, in, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention that. So, uh, it's more than that. Uh, uh, that the, that interaction can explain partially the declining pat uh, pattern 
of the coefficients associating inflation economic uh, slack if you run a, a, a rolling window uh, regression. But of course, uh, any series with a, a, a steady, tra steady trend crew do the job. So uh, to provide a more robust uh, assessment of, of the problem, they estimate some interest level Phillips uh, curve. So it's basically a pattern estimation with the, 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 the Phillips curve. And then once they split the, the, the sample between low trade share and high trade share, they find that among the high trade share industries, uh, the, 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 the Phillips curve is flattened. So the obvious concern here, uh, the obvious concern here is about potential confounding factors for trade exposure. Of course, trade exposure correlates with other things. The first confounding factor that came up to my mind was financial frictions, precisely because of Simon's highly inflation research. So uh, if for some reason firms, uh, exporters are important, they face more stringent external finance uh, constraints they buy set their prices uh, for, for, for cash flow concerns. Another potential confounding factor is capital uh, intensity. So Sofia Balduco, my colleague here at the bank, uh, and her co-authors co has this nice paper showing that under costly capital mobility, uh, firms with low capital intensity tend to support more. So it might be a, 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 a another confounding factor. And the last thing the, the authors uh, did to, to provide more evidence of this flattening is that uh, uh, structural identification through the favor, I think uh, Simon went over in details uh, about the, the, the strategy. And once you consider a, a shock to the financial conditions or a demand shock, you obtain a much lower, uh, obtain a much lower, so, oh, sorry. How do, do, do I point here? Ah, here, okay. So, uh, uh, once you consider a, a high trade intensity industry, the response of the inflation to the shock is much more smaller than in the low trade intensity. If you look at the responses of activity are similar. If you look at the supply shock, you got the same results. The response uh, is attenuated for high trade uh, uh, industries and exacerbated for uh, low trade and response of activity uh, barely changed. So the question that came to my mind. So the, the, the bottom line of the FAVAR evidence is that the trade exposures attenuates the response of inflation to shocks. So the, 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 the next question that came to my mind was whether these findings would be consistent with the new Keynesian paradigm. So what I did, I took the textbook new Keynesian model from uh, Jordi's book based on his paper with Tommaso Monacelli. I consider the textbook calibration coupled with the flexible CP, CPI inflation targeting rule. Recall that the parameter nu governs the degree of openness in the in this small in this economy, and then I compute uh, IRFs and post-response functions in an economy with low trade and an economy with high trade. Of course, uh, the map between theory and the empirical exercise are far from, is far from being perfect. Uh, perfect actually is, is really perfect, but here just one at first glance to see if these attenuation uh, and amplification responses will be consistent with an out of shelf new Keynesian model. In my defense, this is the right model and device for the Chilean economy. So once you, you, you consider a discount rate shock, a demand shock, we got the, the attenuation uh, Simon Fine found in his paper. So in, a, in the high trade economy, the response of inflation is much more attenuated than in uh, the low trade economy. Uh, 
the output gap also uh, attenuated, but to a lesser extent. If you consider technology shock, like a supply shock in, in this economy, you have some also some attenuation of the response of inflation uh, to the technology shock. The output gap will depend on the horizon you consider. And if you consider a monetary policy shock, uh, we don't find that attenuation you found in the, in the data. So if you consider a monetary policy shock with that, uh, with, with that rule I used, with the, the Taylor rule I used, uh, you get some amplification. Uh, you, you got some uh, amplification in the high trade economy. So the, my final comment, uh, re, my final comment regards these nice graphs. Uh, the paper also shows some evidence that the re, uh, recession, recessions, the relationship between inflation and economic impact, largely disappears. So here, uh, I will take that picture to uh, advertise my own research. I apologize in advance for the shameless self promotion. So I have these papers with a bunch of engineers, I'm the only economist in this paper, that will try to forecast inflation using several machine learning methods. So what I'm reporting here is the results of this regression in which we regress the difference of the pseudo out of sample forecasting error of that machine learning method, random forest, which is really linear with respect to all other models we consider, we regress on a, on a dummy uh, accounting for expansions and on a dummy accounting for, for recessions. I don't expect you to, to read these numbers. The bottom line, the takeaways here are the following. The random forest method, which is highly linear, is the winner one. Most coefficients are neg negative. And more important and related to that graph, uh, the gains uh, of the random forest method seems to be coming from recession. So the magnitudes of the difference between the random forest and other model are much higher during recessions than do uh, expansion. I don't have, uh, uh, I don't know exactly the, 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 the precise mechanisms. We are working on that, we are struggling to understand that precise mechanism that make the highly, this highly nonlinear method to beat other methods, but perhaps the interplay between uh, 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 nonlinearity and rich variable selection of some machine learning methods may shed, la may shed light on inflation dynamics during uh, downturns. So again, that's my job in the paper, as the other guys are, 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 are a bunch of engineering. So conclusions, this is a great uh, contribution. Uh, my view is that the paper provides many novel findings from a variety of perspectives. Altogether, this finding corroborates the view that trade reduced the responsiveness of inflation to output gap. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you, both of you. Now we are collecting quest questions. Uh, it's a very persuasive the idea, but you have that the Phillips curve slope is coming down and trade is going up, but so it could be sort of a spurious. So you go then and then you disaggregate. Now, my question is in order for trade to be a, 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 a reason for the flattening, we would expect perhaps that the, that the, the you should compare the composition of sectors, so the high trade should be increasing in, in share and, and, and the low trade declining. Perhaps you can go more granular and look at several sectors. So in order for trade to explain this, if you say that across sectors there is no change, well, it's, it's a composition effect. That, that, that's my interpretation for that. Uh, a very interesting paper. Um, I have a very specific suggestion for a variation on the aggregate regression. So you allow um, the Phillips curve coefficient to depend on the trade share. So another variable the Phillips curve coefficient might depend on is the 
trend or long-term level of inflation. It's measured by some smooth or some long-term forecast. And um, uh, that is, there's some collinearity, of course, over the sample period, trade share has been going up, um, trend inflation has been going down. Um, I hypothesize that, that if you allow the Phillips curve slope to depend on those two things, that um, the trend inflation effect will knock out the trade share effect. Because I, I think the timing sort of works better. But that's just a hypothesis that you can obviously test. Jordi. Um, in, in, the, you know, in the textbook model that Eduardo, for instance, re referred to, uh, there is the assumption of uh, producer currency pricing. So produ uh, pr firms just look at their own marginal costs when, when setting prices. Now, in, there are many people have argued that uh, that's not the, the, the way the world works and, and, and that all, uh, firms also look, in addition to their marginal cost, at the price of competitors. And it could be firms, uh, the prices of um, goods that are imported into the country or the prices of, of, of goods of, of, you know, of goods produced uh, that you, you compete on the export side. So that, the, if, if that, that, so that, that concern um, uh, um, when setting prices may explain, could potentially explain this, but, but I, I think it would be very useful, if that's the case, it would be very useful to, to look at the response of the exchange rate, because it's, depending on the response of the exchange rate, um, you would have either attenuation or uh, amplification. So, and the response of the exchange rate is different principle. If it's a monetary policy, an expansionary monetary policy shock, which the, you know, because the interest rate declines, say, and that leads to a depreciation of the currency, or whether it's the demand shock and the, the central bank responds by increasing the, the interest rate. So the movement between the exchange rate uh, and output, say, is, is uh, and, and the output gap is different depending on the source. So, maybe conditioning somehow on the on the on the response of the exchange rate uh, could be could be useful again to to further our understanding of what's behind this. Please. So, the, bringing the trade shares in automatically makes this kind of an international setup, and so I'm thinking. How does this work for a global economy? The trade share, to some extent, is standing, I think, maybe for some of the things Jordi was mentioning, uh, pass-through of exchange rate shocks and things like that. We, then we do know that inflation targeting has reduced the pass-through enormously of, ex of exchange rates. And so there's something else going on here. But more generally speaking, it makes you want to think about uh, the rest of the world when you bring the trade shares. Any other question, comments, no? Okay, um, so first of all, I want to thank Eduardo for some uh, very good comments. Um, I, uh, just one uh, comment there, which is the confounding factors, I think is, is interesting. It, in other work, we've actually used this data to look at the financial angle of this, and uh, there what you find, you can sort of rank these industries by the severity of their kind of financial conditions, and. And there what you find is actually that the industries that have the most severe, like the industries were dominated by smaller, younger firms, so you would think they have the most financing issues, their, their prices respond the least. So, so we have some evidence on that, but that's sort of a separate topic, and so I didn't want to, I also, I don't think that that necessarily has been changing over time, so I don't think it's about like the flattening of the Phillips curve per se, so um, we didn't want to go there in this paper. Um, and uh, Gregorio, you asked about the high trade share. Um, is it increasing the aggregate? So, or, or um, is it stable? Well, it's it's clearly not stable because in the aggregate it's changing dramatically. So it must also be changing across these industries over time. We're we're taking a snapshot of the later sample period, where I think they're they're somewhat stable, right? But but we haven't, for example, examined within this sample. You know, are these trade shares changing a lot, or are there industries where these things changed a lot, for example, or something like that? So, um, but but it's clear that in the you know the U.S. has become much more exposed to trade than it was in the past. So, um, Larry, I fully agree that you know putting trend inflation in there and thinking about that interaction is is a, a very useful thing to do. So, um, and um, uh, and and 
Yeah, Jordi, I think you're absolutely right about, um, you know, how do we think about the pricing decision of these firms when they're operating in a global market? Um, I think, um, you know, are they pricing to the local market? Are they pricing to the global market? Um, you know, is the U.S. special because everything gets priced in dollars and relative to other peop other countries? And so, would some of this maybe not show up in other countries? You know, there are a lot of interesting questions. So, um, and um, I, I thought about doing a shock to the exchange rate, but I didn't wasn't sure what that would be. So I, I didn't want to go there. So so, um, but we can look at how the exchange rate is mo moving. That certainly we can do. So, um, and 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 John, yes, I'm. I'm wishing I was an international economist, so but um, but I'm learning. So um, uh, so I do actually have a two-country model recently, but um, it, it it talks about other mechanisms. But I think it would be um, definitely the next step. I think would be given. I think these results are fairly interesting in terms of the trade exposure. To think, okay, how well would they fit into a modeling environment that w would be familiar to all of us, and what might that imply in terms of global activity versus local activity? So those are all excellent, excellent comments. So thank you. Well, applaud him. Thank you very much. Now we have a coffee break of 30 minutes, and then we'll return to hear the last paper of the day. Thank you.
We are ready. Okay, now we are going to listen Jordi Galli. He will present us Has the US Wage Philip Kerr flattened a semi structural exploration? Um, Jordi Galli is a senior researcher at the Center for Research in International Economics, professor at Universitat Pompeu Fabra, and research professor at the Barcelona ESE. He has held academic position at New York University and Columbia University and visiting professor at MIT. He is research associate at National Bureau of Economic Research and fellow of the Economic, Econometric Society and the European Economic Association. Gali's research centers on the causes of business cycles and the optimal monetary policy, especially through the lens of time series analysis. He holds a PhD uh, from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Please, you have 35 minutes. Okay, well, I guess it would not be too appropriate for me to thank the organizers for inviting me to, <laughs> to give this paper since I am one of the co-organizers. So, but uh, let me thank the Central Bank of uh, Chile for uh, asking me to to organize this event, which I'm uh, enjoying very much. Uh, very good. So this is um, joint work with um, uh, Luca Gambetti, who is here, who had this, he, he has discussed the paper already uh, this morning. And it's on, on, on the behavior of uh, the wage Phillips curve. So let, let's see if I know how to this. OK, thank you. So, the, I mean, in front of this audience and given all these papers that uh, we've seen today, um, uh, the, the, this, the, the, this paper doesn't need much uh, motivation. Um, uh, the, the US economy and other advanced economies uh, face what is known as the twin puzzle. And the twin puzzle refers to, to the fact that, you know, despite the, this very large adjustment of the unemployment rate upward and downward during the uh, Great Recession and, and, and in its aftermath, the inflation measures haven't really responded uh, much, okay? even though this has been the largest uh, uh, um, adjustment in the, in, in the unemployment rate that the U.S. economy has experienced in the, in the, in the post-war period. So um, it was missing. In, uh, missing deflation during the, the, the recession and missing uh, inflation uh, during the, the recovery. Now, of course, uh, th 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 this uh, is important for central banks because uh, a, a flatter Phillips curve, which is what that evidence seems to suggest, Im implies that um, if there are uh, uh, deviations from, from, of inflation from an inflation target, there may be a need for more extreme uh, um, policies to be to be implemented. The sacrifice ratio uh, associated with any uh, permanent change in the in inflation will be uh, larger. And more generally, I think it poses a, a, a challenge to, to to inflation targeting frameworks because those frameworks rely very much on the idea that there is some connection between the level of economic slack and inflation because central banks cannot influence inflation directly. They do so by influencing the level of economic slack. Um, but, um, so through changes in interest rates and, and other measures. So if, if, if inflation becomes decoupled from, from, from economic activity, it's hard to see how a uh, central bank could uh, have any imp imp influence on inflation and, and hence the, the, the whole inflation targeting framework uh, uh, um, will be called into, into question. Now, in this paper, we focus on a particular dimension of the, of the relationship between inflation and economic activity, which is the wage Phillips curve. Okay, so um, on, on, on the connection between wage inflation and uh, the unemployment rate. And uh, you, you know, many people think that the behavior of wage inflation during the, the recent episode is at the heart of this dis disconnect between price inflation and, and measures of economic activity. Now, the paper has two parts. First, we document uh, 
um, the changes over time in, in, in the wage Phillips curve. Okay, so using, you know, so it will be some, just some reduced form evidence um, based on OLS uh, uh, regressions and using a, a very um, simple specification of the wage Phillips curve. Then I will point to some shortcomings of that, of that approach. And uh, in the second part of, of the paper, we propose a methodology, if you want, to uh, overcome uh, those shortcomings. And, and that's what we call semi-structural semi -structural evidence. So the idea here is to use, uh, to decompose the, the um, um, measures of inflation and unemployment into different components and to use uh, and to estimate what we call a conditional Phillips curve using uh, as, um, as data just a specific components of, of, of inflation and unemployment, okay? So I'll, 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 you'll see later how, how that works. Now, again, so here are just some recent papers that uh, have documented these uh, changes in the Phillips curve here, and are the, difference, the main differences in our approach uh, have to do with uh, uh, the focus on wage inflation and the semi-structural approach that I had mentioned earlier. Okay, so let me start by showing you a scatter plot of wage inflation and the unemployment rate. Okay, so uh, again, if you, and this is for the post-war uh, period, the measure of inflation is, uh, is average hourly um, earnings for uh, production and non-supervisory non workers. And, you know, if you look just at the, at the observations here, these quarterly data, uh, I mean, uh, you know, uh, I guess one should call this the Phillips circle more than the Phillips curve. But, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, the green uh, dots, those correspond to a particular period, which is somewhat special. It's the, it's the great inflation period and the subsequent uh, disinflation uh, associated with uh, uh, um, Volcker's uh, 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 chairmanship. So those are period, th that's a period in which the mean inflation changed a lot, and hence that may have, uh, if, if wage inflation to some extent depends not only on the unemployment rate or, or, or some measure of economic slack, but also on, on price inflation, that would have, that uh, is a reason why um, the, the Phillips curve may have shifted. Now for the, for the remaining periods, okay, that includes part of the 60s, the data starts in 64 here, uh, the great moderation and the crisis and recovery, well, there's something, uh, you know, it has more of a shape of a, of, a, of a curve. And here is where we see, you know, that, you know, if, we, if you look at the red dots, that those correspond to the crisis and recovery, so we see that the, the relationship seems to have become somewhat flatter, okay? So that's, that's consistent with the, this, this view that, that the Phillips curve has, has um, uh, flattened, okay? But this is just a... Uh, an unconditional, this gives us an idea of the un why the unconditional correlation may have weakened, but of course we're not controlling for other variables like inflation and, and for, as, or for shocks that may have shifted the, that uh, Phillips curve, okay? So here's the, the specification that we're going to, to uh, focus on, okay? So we have, uh, this is wage inflation, quarterly uh, wage inflation, this is a measure of lagged price inflation, uh, and the idea is to think of whatever measure of lagged price inflation is relevant for um, uh, wage indexation purposes, or that workers, uh, you know, uh, care about when they, they, to the extent that they index partly uh, uh, wage inflation to, 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 to price inflation. Gamma here, one can interpret as, a, as, a, as, a, as, as being related to the degree of price indexation, and here we have, we have the unemployment rate, and this is a, a shock, okay, or some error term. Now, what's be, what, what, there is some, an equation like this can be given some micro foundations, and I think it's useful in order to interpret, uh, for instance, the nature of the error term, okay? So very quickly here, this is based on some work of uh, mine, uh, and um, but but which which relies on on you know on a, on, on a standard specification of of a wage uh, of a wage setting. So it's it's a, a model with of culver wage setting with partial indexation, 
that is embedded in, I would say, uh, the vast majority of uh, um, DSG models that are being used at central banks uh, around the world. It's originally due to, to Erzak, Henderson, uh, and Levin. Okay? So that model of wage shitting uh, implies an equation for wage inflation that looks like this. Okay, so here we have wage, inf wage inflation, expected wage inflation, and this is the deviation of the average wage markup from the natural wage markup, where the natural wage markup is the markup that we would observe if wages were fully flexible. Okay? Now, uh, this, this is not, strictly speaking, wage inflation. This is the, um, that's, the, that's the, the reason for the tilde here. It's the gap between wage inflation and some uh, weighted average of steady state price inflation and, st and lagged price inflation. Okay, so, um, and again, this captures this automatic wage indexation that is assumed in, in the model. So, uh, even though wages, nominal wages are sticky, individual wages are sticky and they are adjusted only infrequently, those uh, workers who do not reoptimize their wages uh, see their wages mechanically adjusted according to uh, some measure, according to this, to this um, variable here, this weighted average of, of steady state inflation and lagged price inflation. Okay? Now, if you assume and that this wage markup gap follows an AR1 process, and this is, you know, this is true under certain assumptions. This will be true in equilibrium on, under certain assumptions about the driving forces of the economy and so on. Um, one can solve this equation forward and obtain an expression like this. Okay? It relates this measure of, let me call it, modified wage inflation to the wage markup gap. Okay? So that's the first step. The second step, one can derive, and this is what is based on my, my, my own work, earlier work, one, one can show that this uh, wage uh, markup is related, is proportional to the gap between, uh, the, this is the log of the labor supply and this is the log of employment. And that gap can be interpreted, uh, it's not, it doesn't exactly correspond to the st standard measures of, of unemployment rate, but it's something that is very close to it, okay? So now, of, um, you know, you, you can plug this into here, you can combine the, the two and rearrange terms and you get a wage inflation equation that looks like this. And this, as you can see, takes exactly the same form as, the, as that simple um, equation that I showed you earlier that we're going to estimate. Um, this gamma is the, the extent to which um, now has a, an interpretation. It's the, it's, it's the extent to which wage inflation is indexed to lagged price inflation. Uh, the coefficient on the unemployment rate has also a structural interpretation and is related, among other things, to the degree of wage stickiness, which affects this, this coefficient here. And most importantly for our purposes, the um, error term in, in this equation okay, has uh, an interpretation. It's related to fluctuations in this natural wage markup, or um, which uh, you know, we typically view as uh, exogenous. Okay? Very good. So that, again, just an attempt to provide some micro foundations to, to this. So, so these are the data that we're going to use. So we'll, um, as I said, average hourly, hourly earnings of production and non-supervisory workers as a measure of, of, of wages, the GDP deflator as a measure of inflation, and the civilian unemployment rate. And we look at two sample periods, the, what, the pre-crisis period and the crisis and recovery period. But we also, we will focus, for reasons that will become clear, we will also uh, show some results for the great moderation period, what we call the great moderation period, okay, which is a, just a, 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 a subset or um, which is contained in the pre-crisis uh, period, okay? So I'll, I'll, what I'll do next is just to show you this, I'll show you several tables, they all have the same structure, and they just, and they report the estimates of, of that simple, um, uh, the OLS estimates of that simple equation, okay? So, again, here you have the coefficient on lagged inflation on the unemployment rate, and here you have the different sample periods and the p-values for tests of equality uh, um, between, between uh, of coefficients between periods. So, things to observe. First, one, 
I, I will show you, as I said, several tables um, that are using alternative data or alternative specifications. And uh, there is one feature that shows very clearly in, on every table, okay? Which is the coefficient on, on price inflation, okay? Declines over time and essentially becomes uh, uh, insignificant, okay? And the other feature that will also uh, be very robust and will show on, on every table uh, is that, you know, the coefficient on the unemployment rate, you know, which is significant and negative as we would expect, okay, this is for the full pre-crisis period, okay, it seems to increase in absolute value during the great moderation period, okay, that's something that as far as I know um, had not been uh, pointed to by um, before, had not been observed before, and then it declines dramatically in the, in the um, crisis and recovery period. Okay, so that the, there is no monotonic decline in that coefficient, but it seems to, you know, seems to increase first and then decline in absolute uh, value. It's still significant uh, at the end of the, of the sample period. Okay, now, okay, so this is based on, on rolling regressions. This is the unemployment coefficient, and you know, it, it captures essentially what I said. It was uh, low in the early part of the sample, and it became more negative, larger in absolute value, more ne negative in, during the great moderation period, and then it becomes, it, it shrinks during the, the crisis and the recovery period. Okay? This is the coefficient on, on, on lacked inflation, and again, you can see that you know, in, in the recent period, it's essentially, it's, in, it's, it's in significantly different from uh, zero. Now, uh, Okay, so this is a table that has exactly the same structure as before, but now instead of uh, the GDP deflator as a measure of price inflation, we use CPI, okay? And, but again, the results are identical, at least qualitatively. Here, we use lagged unemployment rate as opposed to a contemporaneous unemployment rate. The results do not change, okay? Uh, here, we use... Um, in the previous uh, tables, we were using quarterly, the, la the uh, uh, lagged quarterly uh, price inflation uh, on the right-hand side. Here we use uh, lagged year-on-year, -year, so the average of, of uh, four previous quarters, uh, 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 um, inflation on the right-hand side. And again, not the two key findings that I, that I had stressed uh, 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 survive, okay? So th th those findings seem to be pretty robust. Now, what, what's the main, what are the main shortcomings of this kind of evidence, okay? Well, first, I mean, the specification of the wage inflation equation, uh, you know, maybe con viewed as ad hoc, and I, I you know, I tried, I given you some micro foundations and so on, but um, you may not be completely convinced by those. Uh, it's unlikely to be, the coefficients are unlikely to be deeply structural, that is, uh, they may not be invariant to, to regime uh, shifts. And the one that we are going to stress here is that the error term in that, uh, in that equation uh, is likely to be correlated with the, reg the regressors, okay? And this, uh, this correlation emerges very naturally if one gives the, interpret, the structural interpretation that, I, that I've given you earlier, because the, that error term is not measurement error or, or, or something uh, that can, cannot have a, a, a simple economic interpretation, but has the economic interpretation of wage markup shocks, okay? Um, and wage markup shocks, uh, when embedded in, in any standard DIG model, generate responses in inflation, in price inflation, in wage inflation, in the unemployment rate, and so on. So um, that, would, uh, that would imply that OLS estimates of uh, the coefficients in that equation would be, uh, uh, would be biased. Now, there is work as bet by Smeds and Vouters and, and, and another paper of, of uh, Smeds and Vouters with myself showing that uh, those wage markup shocks are non-negligible sources of fluctuations, okay? They are not something that we, we can ignore because they are, they are tiny, but they seem to be non-negligible sources of fluctuations in both quantities and, and, and prices. And in particular, they have significant effects of un on unemployment and inflation. And that's what would generate this bias in all OLS estimates. But not only that, the relative importance of these um, 
wage markup shocks may have changed over time. Okay? And those changes over time in, in, the, in, in the volatility or the, the variance of these wage markup shocks would uh, lead to uh, um, change in, in the estimated uh, uh, coefficients when using OLS. Okay? So they may give the impression okay, of a structural change over time when, uh, in truth, the only thing that is happening is that the, 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 the volatility of wage markup shocks may have changed over time. Okay? Very good. So we're going to try to, to overcome that uh, limitation. So what we do is the following. So we estimate the component of fluctuations in wage inflation, price inflation, and the unemployment rate that is orthogonal to wage markup shocks. Okay? And, and um, we, using a framework that allows for these uh, structural ch uh, uh, changes over time. We need to, in order to be consistent with, uh, to, with, with uh, the, the uh, the, the hypothesis that you know there may have been structural changes over time. We need to use a, an empirical framework um, that allows for those uh, uh, changes over time. Okay, in order to obtain this decomposition. Okay, so the idea is well, if x is a vector of variables that includes wage inflation, price inflation, and the unemployment rate, we can decompose that vector into two components. This is the component that is associated with wage markup shocks. This would be the wage markup shocks. And this is the component that uh, is associated with all other shocks in the, in the economy. Okay? And we're, so what we're going to do is to try to, you know, to uncover uh, this component of all variables and then re-estimate, we're going to re-estimate re the wage Phillips curve using uh, that, this component, okay? which by construction will be orthogonal to wage markup shocks. Okay? And this is what we call the conditional uh, wage Phillips curve. Okay, and in addition, we are going since that that still relies on a particular specification of the wage Phillips curve, which you may not be uh, happy with, with. We are going to provide other measures of the changing relationship between unemployment and, and wage inflation that, um, uh, I, I, again, that are conditional on specific shocks other than the wage markup shock, and that do not rely on a specific uh, um, a specific. Um, equation, and this is related to the dynamic multipliers that, that Matteo uh, showed us uh, this morning. It's, it's, a, it's essentially the same, the same idea. Okay? So here is our empirical model very, uh, very quickly, and without getting into, into the details. It's a, a, a structural uh, VAR model that allows for um, changes over time in, 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 in all the coefficients. Okay? So, this, is, this would be the reduced VAR, okay? so it's a, it takes this form of a standard reduced form VAR. This would be the innovations in the variables in X. What does X contain? It contains the first difference of the log of labor productivity, wage inflation, price inflation, the unemployment rate, and the long-term interest rate. And we use the long-term interest rate and not the short-term interest rate because our, our sample period contains the zero lower, the period in which the zero lower bound is binding and don't want to, we don't want to have any trouble um, in that uh, uh, regard. So we use a, uh, the 10-year government uh, bond yield which never hit the, the, the zero lower bound. Okay, so the only, the, the difference with the standard model is that this, all these matrices, you see, have, have a T subscript. That means that they are allowed to change over time. Okay? Now, this is the variant, this sigma is the variance covariance matrix of the innovations, which is also allowed to uh, change over time. And finally, the mapping, you know, in these structural VARs, the, the, it is typically assumed that there is a linear mapping between the reduced form innovations and the contemporaneous structural shocks. Okay, and that's what it's assumed here. We also make that assumption, but the, the, that linear mapping is also allowed to change over time. That's why it has this T. Epsilon here is the vector of structural shocks. Okay? So we carry out the estimation as in, in um, work by Del Negro and Primicieri. Okay, there's nothing novel in terms of the particular way we estimate uh, this. And, you know, the, the outcome of this is uh, uh, um, what uh, is ultimately this, no? the, the, what we call the structural, local, time-varying coefficients moving average representation, okay? which relates each variable in xt to the current and lagged values of each of the structural shocks. Okay? So now what we need to, to do in order to, you know, to, to, 
uh, uh, estimate this, this uh, CT of L, okay, these are this contains all just the impulse responses to all the shocks, and but with a time subscript, so we have an impulse response for each period, is to, to impose a number of identifying restrictions that allows us to recover this matrix uh, uh, QT. Okay? And what are those restrictions? So these, these, are the, uh, these are the restrictions that we use that we are, are largely informed by the properties of DS, standard DSG models. Okay? And, and we think our, our, uh, are lar should be largely uncontroversial. First, the first one is based on some earlier work of mine uh, that uh, uh, assumes that technology shocks are the only shocks that can have a permanent effect on the level of labor productivity. So that's a long-run restriction that we impose. And the rest are sign restrictions. And what are those sign restrictions? What we call demand shocks, which should be interpreted as non-monetary demand shocks, are shocks that are the only shocks that generate, first, that do not have a permanent effect on labor productivity and so on, but that's common to all shocks other than technology, but they are the only shocks that generate a positive co-movement between output, price inflation, and the long-term interest rate. The idea being here that the central bank, here the Fed, responds by increasing interest rates whenever output and inflation uh, uh, Increase and they do so. The central bank does so in a per persistent way, so that it is reflected in the long-term uh, rate. Now, monetary policy shocks generate a positive co-movement between output and price inflation, but a negative co-movement with uh, the long-term interest rate. Okay, because here it's the change in the interest rate that is driving the the change in in output and inflation in the opposite direction. Then we have price markup shocks, which are the shocks that generate a positive co-movement between, are the only shocks that generate a positive co-movement between price inflation and the price markup, where the price markup is, is uh, a, a linear combination of some of the variables that enter vector x. It's the gap between labor productivity and the real wage, or if you want, is the price level minus marginal cost, okay? And wage markup shocks are the only shocks that generate a positive co-movement between, uh, uh, between wage inflation and the unemployment rate. Okay? And again, that's a, a property that, that holds in, 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 in this uh, medium-scale uh, New Keynesian uh, models. Okay? Very good. So, again, using these restrictions, we estimate the different components of, of, the, of the different variables in X, and now we, and we remove the component for each variable, we remove the component associated with wage markup shocks, okay? And the remaining components are orthogonal to that, so we can use them to estimate the, 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 the wage Phillips curve uh, in a way that is not uh, subject to the, to the biases that we otherwise uh, would have had, okay? And that's what we call the conditional wage Phillips curve, okay? So again, this is the specification using the GDP deflator, quarterly GDP deflator as a uh, uh, lagged quarterly GDP deflator inflation as a measure of price inflation, okay? And the structure is the same as, as before. So what do we see here? Well, you know, the absolute values of the estimates change, okay? And in ways that are you know, substantial, but the, the overall picture doesn't change. Okay, so in particular, we see that lagged inflation, lagged price inflation, uh, has a shrinking influence on wage inflation over time. So that's consistent with the evidence that we had obtained with using OLS. Um, the uh, the coefficient on the unemployment rate appears to be much larger than estimated with uh, OLS. Okay, but um, uh, the pattern over time is the same that I had uh, emphasized earlier. So, okay, so it, it increases during the mo great moderation in absolute value, and then it shrinks substantially during the crisis and recovery period. But you know the you know the value is in, when using uh, you know OLS this was minus zero point eleven. Okay, so it's it's when using this alternative approach that coefficient. Is, is, is much larger in absolute uh, value, okay? And this is the, the, the rolling regressions associated, no, again, using that 
the non-wage markup component of the variables, and you see, uh, again, this is the unemployment coefficient over time, and you see that you know, it's, it's, the estimates are somewhat uh, fl uh, flatter. They don't change so much over time as suggested by, by the OLS, uh, the, the, by, by using OLS with uh, the uh, in, um, uh, raw data, okay, as opposed to with that specific component, okay? This is the coefficient on, on locked inflation. It's, the picture is very similar to, to the one that we that was based on the raw data. Okay. And this, again, uses alternative specifications here, locked unemployment. Again, same, same picture. Uh, uh, the year-on-year -year GDP deflator, similar patterns. Okay. So this is actually one which there is a slight difference because you know this, this coefficient really doesn't go down to a value close to zero, and it remains significant. That's the, okay. But the pattern for the unemployment coefficient is the same. Okay. Now, again, this is the, 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 these tables that I showed you um, were based on this par particular uh, uh, specification of the wage inflation equation. Okay. And uh, well, that has a number of uh, limitations, as I said. You know, it may be viewed as kind of ad hoc. And also, you know, it was implicitly assuming, we were implicitly assuming that the coefficients, at least within each subsample period, remained constant, okay? Whereas, you know, our uh, structural VAR approach was allowing for a continuous change in those coefficients. So there was some kind of inconsistency there. Okay, so let's use an approach that, is, that imposes less structure, okay? That only imposes the, the, the assumptions implicit in the VAR, okay? And these are, no, this, uh, what we call the conditional dynamic multipliers, and again, that's what's similar to what Matteo showed us uh, this morning, but applied to different variables. Here we have the multiplier, not between uh, unit labor costs and price inflation, but between the unemployment rate and wage inflation, okay? So that's the... That's how we define the multiplier. So it's a ratio of the cumulative sum of impulse responses. In the numerator, you have the, the cumulative response of wage inflation to a particular shock, a particular structural shock. And in the denominator, you have the cumulative response of the unemployment rate to the same shock. So it's a ratio of the areas under the impulse response. Now, the, the nice thing or the nice feature of this is that this, this multiplier, you know, has a time subscript, okay? So our, our, our framework allows, allows us to estimate a mul uh, this multiplier for each period and to see how that multiplier has changed over time. And of course, it also depends, K here is the horizon. We can compute this multiplier at different, we have to truncate it somehow, no? So we, 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 we can compute it at different, at different horizons. So I, what I will show you next, and that will be the last piece of evidence, is, the uh, evolution over time of these dy uh, conditional dynamic multipliers um, um, in response to different shocks other than the wage markup shock. In particular, this is the res to, in response to monetary policy shocks. Okay, so here you have uh, time, okay, actual, actual time, and for each period, okay, for each historical period, we, you have the the multiplier at different horizons, okay? We compute the multiplier up to eight quarter, an eight quarter horizon, okay? So we can look at how that multiplier has changed at the short horizons or at the slightly longer horizons, okay? And what we see is that the multi, uh, first, the multiplier is negative, okay? Because there is a, uh, in response to monetary policy shocks, there is a, 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 a negative, or the, the, those shocks generate a negative co-movement between the unemployment, rate and the unemployment rate and wage inflation, as expected, okay? But you can see that in absolute value, okay, it goes down over time, especially in the short run, but also, okay, even though not, not so dramatically, at, at the longer horizon, okay? So again, this is consistent with the idea of uh, uh, weakening of the relationship between the unemployment rate and wage inflation over time, and it suggests that this has been a very gradual uh, uh, change over time, okay? Uh, okay, so this contrasts a bit with, with uh, some of the evidence that, that we showed earlier. 
This is the same, but in response to demand shocks, the non-monetary demand shocks, okay? And again, uh, the picture is very similar. It's a bit more uh, rugged, but uh, uh, you can see that over time, uh, you know, the, the, that multiplier declines in absolute value, both in the short run and at longer horizons. When we consider also, uh, we consider also a price markup shock, and here, for a price markup shock, perhaps surprisingly, uh, we don't observe that um, shrinking in absolute value of this multiplier. And again, we, we, we don't have a, a, any, any obvious explanation for, for that, okay? But it's some, we, we don't, essentially it remains, the multiplier remains uh, largely unchanged uh, over time, okay? So just to conclude, the, what was the initial question that we had posed? Uh, well, has the U.S. wage Phillips curve flattened over time? And the reduced form evidence uh, uh, suggests that the answer is yes, substantially, but not monotonically. Now, when we look at what we call the semi-structural evidence, okay, using these components of uh, the different variables, the answer remains a positive one but uh, the, the changes appear to be less uh, uh, dramatic than implied by, by the, the reduced form evidence. Uh, and in all cases, what we seem to, to, to obtain is this uh, vanishing effect of past price inflation on, on wage inflation. Okay, so that's all I have to say. Thank you. Lee in the time. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Now, we are here to Fernanda Necchio. Fernanda is a research advisor at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. Her fields of interest are international macroeconomics and finance, macroeconomics and monetary economics, and she holds a PhD from Princeton University. Please, Fernanda. So uh, first, I would like to thank the, the organizers for including my paper with Oscar in the program and for also giving me the opportunity to discuss uh, this paper uh, tonight. Um, I had a, a great time reading it, and it was, it's very related to the work that Oscar and I were doing on the paper, so it was really interesting for us also to, to read it while we were working on it. Um, as usually people do in discussions, what I'm going to do is to split my discussion in two uh, main uh, point. First, I'll do a short summary of uh, what Jordi just presented, basically because he had 35 minutes to sell it, so I don't have to sell it for him. So my, my comments, my discussion of what he did is, is going to be uh, uh, short. And then what I'll do is to go through the points that I want to make uh, regarding his, his paper. And we'll see that uh, what I'm going to try to do is actually to do something similar to what Luca did in his discussion of my paper, which is to map uh, their work with the framework that Oscar and I had uh, and Oscar presented this morning. And this was not coordinated, but I thought it was interesting that we are uh, doing kind of the same, the same uh, thing. Okay. Uh, so starting by looking at uh, a little summary of what Jordi just presented, uh, they are interested in estimating a wage Phillips curve. Um, and as you know, the picture that Oscar showed this morning sh uh, showed how important it is for us to identify shocks, to be able to estimate, in, in our case, a price Phillips curve, price inflation Phillips curve. And what Jordi Galli and Luca Gambetti are doing here is uh, basically doing the same thing, but using a different framework. So their effort here is to try to identify shocks and, and use the framework to be able to disentangle or estimate the sensitivity of an employment gap or, or measures of economic activity to, uh, to uh, the relationship between economic activity and wage inflation. Um, their main findings uh, are that there is a decline in the slope coefficient, so the sensitivity of wage inflation to unemployment um, has declined. And they also find that there is a shrinking role uh, for price inflation, past inflation. 
Um, a short summary of what they do is, well, they are going to estimate a, a VAR in which they rely on some identification assumptions and focus, well, they present a whole set of results in the paper looking at OLS and, and other types of identification, but uh, one of the most interesting results, which you already got to the end of this presentation, is to look at the dynamic impulse response functions to specific shocks. And those uh, dynamic multipliers are going to be giving you this sen relative sensitivity of inflation and, and unemployment to specific shocks. Uh, if we want to summarize uh, their paper in one picture, I think uh, going back to the picture that Jordi presented here uh, a few minutes ago, uh, this is showing the uh, dynamic multiplier uh, for a monetary shock. Uh, there are three key uh, results here. Uh, first, the multiplier is always negative. Uh, the second one, we are seeing more persistent effects of unemployment on unemployment than uh, wage inflation. And I think one of the most interesting results here is, is the idea that the slope coefficient has declined over time. So if we look at the multiplier over time, it has been declining. Um, and it seems like this decline has been gradual and not driven by the financial crisis per se. So it has been going on for some time. So. Turning to um, uh, my comments, well, they're finding a declining sensitivity of wage inflation to unemployment. Uh, in the paper, they go through different measures of uh, inflation, uh, variations in the data, variations in the specification, uh, and the results are, are pretty robust. Uh, Interestingly, in this morning, Oscar uh, presented our paper in which we were showing a similar uh, evidence in, in some ways, but using price the price inflation Phillips curve. So one of the main results in Gali and Gambetti here is that the slope of the wage Phillips curve uh, has declined. Um, Oscar and I showed in our paper that the slope of the Phillips curve has, is much smaller than it used to be uh, in the past. Um, so the question that I, that I want to try to answer in my last uh, few minutes is, what would uh, Oscar and I say about the wage Phillips curve? So Gali and Gobetti are approaching uh, the data by looking at the US uh, data. Oscar and I had a big panel of 45 countries or so. Uh, and so what I'm going to do next is, to, is try to expand their model their, uh, their results and look at uh, international evidence on the, uh, on the wage Phillips curve. Um, so, I mean, they have a set of results in the paper, and in the, my next few slides, I'm going to be focusing basically on this decline in the slope of the Phillips curve. So, this is just a simple table summarizing what they found, and, the, and you find that from uh, pre-crisis to post-crisis, there is a sharp decline in the slope of the wage Phillips curve, and you also see a decline uh, in the past inflation coefficient. So this is just a way of me to summarize their results in, in a simple, with a simple table. Now what I want to do is to go from the U.S. evidence to the international evidence. Um, that's a little bit of a challenge. Um, so Oscar and I spent a lot of time cleaning the data and, and so on to build the panel of 45 countries that we had in that paper. I'm not going to be able to do that here. So what I'll do is to focus on OECD uh, countries, which, you know, they're easier to, uh, to obtain data and, and uh, the quality is usually, and the, set, the, the time sample is, is usually much better. Um, I'm going to have to do some adjustments in, in the data that I'm going to use relative to what uh, Jordi and, and Luca had. Uh, I'm going to be using labor compensation as a measure of uh, wage inflation. It is not the, the ideal measure of wage inflation for these purposes, but that's what I could find for a set of countries in a, in a consistent way. Um, I'm going to be using CPI instead of uh, GDP deflator. Um, I want to map their findings to the, the uh, framework that Oscar and I had. So I'm going to be using unemployment gap. 
I've tried using only unemployment and everything holds through. And what I'm gonna be doing is the same um, uh, empirical framework that Oscar presented this morning. So the idea here is that if you, uh, you wanna look at this uh, changes in coefficient over time, but it's possible that sets of countries had trends going on in the past, so we need to take into account those trends to try to, uh, to answer the question whether uh, changes in the coefficient were being driven by specific events or not. So the empirical framework that I'm going to be using here is basically the same that Oscar presented, uh, except that I changed the equation a little bit to get closer to uh, Gary and Gambetti's work. And what we're going to be able to do here is to look at whether the crisis is the one, the financial crisis was the one dri dri driving changes in, in coefficients. Okay, so given that I do, uh, that I change the data quite a lot relative to what they have, the first table here is just redoing that exercise from uh, Gali's uh, and Gambetti's uh, table, but and showing that you know, their main findings still stand. So if you look at the top, um, the top equation, uh, it's just replicating the work by using different uh, measures of, um, of economic activity and different measures of wage inflation, and you still find that you have a decline in the slope coefficient and also a decline in persistence. So what I do next is like, okay, check. You know, if I change a little bit their data and I change a little bit the equation, I still get the same type of results that they have. So let's see what happens when I look at the OECD data, when I look at international evidence. And this is the bottom table. And then I'm looking at the results and I'm like, well, great, persistence, uh, the uh, lag inflation coefficient declined, as in, in Gali and Gambetti, but weirdly, the coefficient on, on Slack on the unemployment gap uh, became stronger. So the sensitivity seems to have increased. And so then what I do is to turn to the, uh, the big table that Oscar didn't want to talk about, and now he makes my life a little bit uh, harder. But here now what we're going to do is to try to see uh, what we get out of the different diff framework. So what I'm doing here is getting my set of OECD countries splitting them between countries that went through the financial crisis, country that didn't, countries that didn't go through the financial crisis, um, and looking at uh, the uh, estimation of, of the slope coefficient and the persistence coefficient. And very interestingly, and in line with the results from uh, Gali and Gambetti, when we look at the countries that have been through the crisis, the bottom uh, red uh, circle, we see a decline in the slope coefficient. But when we focus on countries that did not go through the financial crisis, there is an increase in the absolute value of the, of the coefficient. So the results that I showed you in the previous slide was based, were based the, the increasing in, in the absolute value that I showed you in the previous slide were coming from, from the, this composite, the, the uh, we're basically being driven by the set of countries that are in the no crisis uh, set. Um, this, I think, it's a useful chart that Oscar showed th this morning and basically uh, show you that what's happening b before the crisis and after the crisis with the coefficients that I just presented uh, on, on that table. And um, here, we see uh, the uh, increase in, in the sensitivity of no crisis countries. So this is basically a, a picture of the table that we just looked before. And, but we see a decline in the sensitivity for countries that have been through the financial crisis. Uh, and the diff and diff effect is the, the red bar, uh, and which is telling us that you know, the crisis seems to have, uh, have had a, a big impact uh, in the uh, in the uh, uh, in the set of countries in the sample, um, I want to skip some of my slides and go to the last the last two ones and then come back. Uh, but you know, it's interesting I think to take a little bit of a look on the uh, data set uh, that is driving these results. 
Uh, and so what I have here is the data that is feeding these regressions for wage inflation, and the next slide is gonna show you the unemployment gap uh, uh, data. Um, and I mean, before the, uh, I mean, if we, we are labeling the financial, we started the, started the financial crisis in 2008 uh, Q1, but you can see that the uh, wage inflation was kind of close to each other for no crisis and crisis countries. Again, this is only using OECD data. And, and the financial crisis had uh, some impact on, on wage inflation for both types of countries, but the recovery of wage inflation for no crisis countries seemed to be uh, uh, happen much quicker. And you see a wedge between the, the two average the two rolling averages here. Uh, in terms of unemployment gap, uh, the picture I think is even more interesting. We see before the crisis a boom in both no crisis countries and crisis countries, but the effects of the crisis on the unemployment gap in, in crisis countries is, is much more persistent, right? So, I mean, this is basically giving you a glimpse of a short summary of the data that, that feeds into the re regressions that I was uh, showing you before. So, um, I wanted to uh, go to my last slide and try to summarize what these two papers are finding. Um, so, I think it, both of us, I mean, Gali and Gabetti are taking a different empirical approach than Oscar and I and they are focusing on wage Phillips curve while we are focusing on the price inflation Phillips curve. Uh, both of us are finding uh, a flat Phillips curve, right? So the sensitivity of wage inflation and price inflation to uh, measures of economic activity seem to be smaller than they were in, in the past. Um, so Gali and Gambetti showed this for US evidence. Uh, Oscar and I use uh, Price Phillips curve and international evidence to, to show and find the same findings. In this discussion, what I did was to show that the international evidence also points to a flat uh, wage Phillips, Phillips curve, but it shows that there is a very strong correlation between this flattening and the, uh, and the, financial, the episode of the financial crisis. So after all this, what I think is, is missing in terms of mapping the two, the results of the two papers, is to pointing uh, or pinning down exactly the timing of the decline, when this decline uh, started to happen, and whether if it was driven by the crisis or not. Some results are pointing in one direction, some results are pointing in, in some other. I think we, we have a consensus of a flatter uh, Phillips curve, but I think it's a still uh, a, a question for further research to study more the timing and what is behind uh, the decline in the sensitivity. Thank you. Thank you, Fernanda. We have here a very interesting paper and a very interesting discussion, too. Who make questions, comments? Jordi, I have a couple of questions. Um, so one is uh, when you identify the monetary policy shock with the co-movements thinking about the long yield, there is the episode of the conundrum with the Greenspan in which we knew that uh, tightening policy was not going in the direction of moving the long yield exactly as you would expect it when the short run. So maybe you can just see what happened with that particular episode taking it out from the sample period to see whether you get the same, the same result because the tightening at that point was not actually giving you the correlation that you're using to identify for that three or four years. It might be, you know, maybe I'm a little picky, but I work at the Fed, so just, just to point it out, uh, that's the possibility. So uh, the second comment is, uh, is what is your interpretation in terms of your results? I mean, there's some monetary policy. So it looks like if I believe in your results, the, the slope is smaller, but the, the wage equation is pretty forward looking. Am I reading the results correctly? So, Not so 
-hmm. with the price, the prices are, the coefficient on prices and the wage equation is pretty Correct. small, mm -hmm. which is the lag component. So what, how do you read this in terms of uh, implication for policy? How do you think about, you know, the way wages are set in a way that you're, you know, I think about unemployment now below 4%, 10%, so on the wages, the way they are right now. So somehow you need to be discounting that unemployment is gonna go up somehow to hold up the wages, the way you're seeing, otherwise you would have seen something different. And how do you think in this sort of framework for, for, for monetary policy or the implication for policy? Thank you. Another question? Elias. Thank you. I, I thought that was a very interesting presentation and uh, the, the discussion made an excellent compliment, I think, with the, uh, which relates to the question I want to make. I think the, the key, one of the key issues that emerges from this uh, analysis is whether what you are observing is really something that uh, reflects a structural trend in the economy, so it's like a slow process to time, or it's really related to crisis, uh, in particular financial crisis. So. I thought that the, the, the comments uh, Fernando made were very um, uh, revealing in that, in that respect, or suggestive in that respect. And I would like to link this point with a, with a recent literature, it's more empirical in nature, I guess, at this point, by several papers by uh, Giuseppe Moscarini and Fabian Ostelbinay. What they show, the way I read this literature, is that perhaps unemployment is too coarse of a measure or the actual slack in the labor market. A much, what they argue is that a much better predictor of this, of uh, wage pressures, is actually the, the fraction of people which are uh, making job-to-job -job transitions, are basically being poached by other firms. That, that seems to be the really inflationary component in the labor market, the, the better measure of slack. And how do I relate this to the, the financial crisis issue? Maybe financial crises are periods where something specially happens where labor gets significantly misallocated. And maybe it takes a while for this labor to be reallocated. So maybe you can observe low levels of unemployment, but that's not gonna be inflationary for a while until people you know, start moving up the job ladder and start being poached. So I guess my suggestion is maybe it would be interesting to use the JOLTS data on employment to employment transitions rather than just unemployment. Uh, because if you, if by using this you still find this trend, maybe it's a reflection that there's something more underlying, I don't know, technology, maybe the I.O. in the labor market. But perhaps, the, I don't know, the puzzle could be resolved if we use a more direct measure of, uh, of um, labor market slack. Thank you. Very good. Well, thanks a lot for uh, all the comments. Now, um, Fernanda, uh, thanks, thanks for your discuss the discussion. I have to say that uh, I have enjoyed all, a lot all the sessions uh, today. I have learned a lot of new things and so on, but uh, I think one of the results that you showed in your discussion was one of the most fascinating findings that, uh, that we've had in, um, in, in, in this uh, conference so far. No? The fact that the, there is this, uh, uh, if the, the difference between uh, crisis and non-crisis countries, you know, the direction of the change of the slope coefficient is different. No, uh, that's uh, that's uh, really fascinating and puzzling because it's hard it's hard to understand why that would be the case. Why would the why would the crisis by itself, uh, uh, you know, change? Uh, uh, special a coefficient that we may want to think of as a structural or close to being structural. No, so that's that's um, I think that's a very inter uh, it's, it raises a puzzle that it's I think it's worth uh, mm -hmm. it's worth uh, uh, thinking about more. Also, it it you know if the if the crisis by itself is a source of changes in the in the slope uh, coefficient of the wage Phillips curve, then we have to ask ourselves: Well, you know, uh, when the crisis is uh, gone, will, the, will, will that slope return to its initial values, no? And so will, will the Phillips curve be, become as uh, steep as it was uh, before, okay? Which could be, I mean, if you, if you think of a certain interpretation of your results, that's what they would imply.
Also, the, the fact that for non-crisis uh, countries, that slope has increased, that's, uh, that's uh, also a fascinating result. And I, I mean, I have no, no explanation for, for them, but I think it's, they are really very interesting results. The, the data, it's true, um, I mean, you mentioned it, and I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, you, uh, the compensation data is a bit uh, suspect. Okay, and because even if, even for the U.S., if you look at at the raw data for comp uh, wage inflation using compensation measures, compensation measures are essentially obtained by dividing total labor income uh, by a uh, number of hours worked, okay, uh, or employment and so on. Uh, so they are not direct measures uh, of of, of uh, wages. Um, in contrast with the measure that we used, which is based on the establishment survey, and may abuse, will be imperfect and so on, but at least it's a, it's a direct uh, 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 measure um, of what the compensation per hour is, of what the, okay. So, but other than that, I think it, uh, you know, the, the results were really f uh, fascinating, as I, as I said. Um, uh, David, uh, you mentioned what are the, impl the uh, 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 that your point on the conundrum is well, well taken. Um, of course, when, We'll think about it. I, I, I had not uh, thought about it uh, uh, when you know we, we we decided on our identifying restrictions. We didn't look at the data. We we thought about theoretical models and what their properties were. And I, but I agree that it, it raises an issue with regard to that particular episode. The implications for policy. Um, well, uh, they are. There are manifold, no? The, um, on the one hand, as I said, the, the decrease in the, in, the, in the slope coefficient, on, one would think makes life easier for an inflation targeting uh, uh, central bank because, you know, uh, you know, the economy may go up and down, but uh, you don't have to worry, inflation will remain uh, unchanged. But at the, at the same time, whenever there are deviations uh, of inflation from target, it may be much harder to to uh, go back to target, so it's it's uh, you know there's uh, this this two-sided uh, aspect. With uh, regard to the inflation, the coefficient unlocked inflation. I mean, that it, I think that's good news, uh, unambiguously, because it it suggests that any you know there will be much less uh, em, uh, endogenous persistence in inflation. Uh, whenever you know some some supply shock uh, hits the economy, so it should be much easier for the central bank to to other things equal uh, to bring to bring back uh, inf um, uh, inflation down. So the second round effects, uh, using you know maybe an old-fashioned term terminology, will be will be uh, much weaker. Um, on the that's uh, Elias the, the comment on uh, on. The unemployment rate is a is a blunt measure of yes, uh, I agree. And other people, I, I think, uh, uh, Larry Bald, you, yourself, you have you have suggested that look, looking at short measures of short-term unemployment may be better. There are alternative measures of the unemployment rate, but the one that the, the one that you point to, I think, it's an interesting one to, to look at. I I, 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 have, I haven't uh, looked at that, and I don't I don't know of any any paper that estimates wage inflation. Or, uh, equations and so on that use that use that measure. Uh, I, I, can I, please, you know, as a department chair, and you know, working that that rings incredibly true. The, the, the rate of poaching is is what drives wage inflation. Um, <laughs> The one observation, I think it's, it's right for these um, measures of job-to-job -job transitions, is that there has been a secular decline. I mean, in general, all these measures of, uh, I guess, people call dynamism, labor market dynamism, and so on, they all show uh, secular declines in, in, in the U.S. Uh, so uh, I don't know to what extent this, this uh, could be related to this, uh, to, this weaken, to this decline in the estimated slope of the wage Phillips curve. Just wanted to uh, point at the last measure of the employment to employment transition in the JOLT series is the highest on record right now. So I see. The, so that's different. So it I was trending down, but, uh, but I it, know it that picked that up recently and it's separation it's rates higher. and hiring rates, those show uh, a ah, secular I decline. I, I thought that I that one was also, uh, I see, but it behaves differently. Okay, interesting. <laughs> 
we had a very interesting day, and uh, at the end, those who was invited to the dinner, please, you have to be at the lobby at 7.30 p.m. It's okay, the, the hour? Yes. 35? 7.20. 7.20 at the lobby, please. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow.